Talk a bit, Dala, just a... Okay, we're going to start soon, everyone. I'm going to start the ball rolling today. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm passionate about this topic, so we're just going to spend 20 minutes or so before AJ starts talking about emotions and addictions. Two hours or so before AJ starts. <laughs> Depends on how many questions you ask. <laughs> How's that, babe? Now, how are our video recorders? They are on? Awesome. Good. Great. Thank you. Okay, I'll wait for everyone to get settled. <coughs> Is everyone comfy before we start? And does everyone, anyone who's new, um, just know that children need to be supervised at the centre all, at all times, and I think there might be kids' activities upstairs happening, so just so you know. Okay, um, as I said, I'm going to start the session today, and I'm going to talk about a subject that's been really pertinent for me recently, so it's about addictions and emotions. And I just want to take you through uh, reali some realisations that I had about um, dealing with my emotions and how I was staying in my addictions and becoming quite demoralised in the process. Um, so I had a light bulb moment <laughs> after much uh, frustration and crying and um, that's what I want to share with you today. So to give you some context about... Um, about a month ago, I decided that I still had lots of walls and blocks up with my soulmate, and um, I decided I wanted to deal with that. I wanted to break all that down. I wanted to actually open my heart and be in a really open, loving, almost joining space with my mate. Um, and it's something that I'd been dancing around for about two years, <laughs> feeling like, yep, I'm doing it, and then suddenly I wasn't doing it, and getting quite emotional, and we were living in a place where uh, we'd be coming together and going apart, and it was very tiring and draining, and we're still working through it. <laughs> but this, this group of realisations that I had has been really key in helping me feel empowered in that process, rather than becoming more and more demoralised and hard on myself. So, basically all of us, in some degree or another, especially when we start this path, are basically living in this nebulous mass of addictions. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> it's like, ooh, murky, hey? And they're all interlinking. Um, and does everyone know what I mean by addictions? What do I mean by addictions? Yeah, so some of our addictions are physical. We drink or we eat chocolate or we go running obsession obsessively. But very, the most insidious addictions, the most um, powerful ones in my life that are difficult to kick are the emotional addictions. And they are patterns of um, behaviour, unloving behaviour, that keep me away from my true condition, my real emotions, my fears and my grief. So I'm going to illustrate this little diagram in terms of what I was going through with our soulmate relationship. So my addictions in that relationship have been, um, let's call it distance. So i.e., every time we'd come closer together, I was comfortable at this place. If AJ had come a bit further, closer, I'd want to go back here because that felt a little bit too close. It felt a little bit too vulnerable. And then he'd go, oh, this is not very nice and a bit painful and go away. And then I'd go, hang on, I want to be close to you again. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? <laughs> that, that this is a big pattern and a lot of fears that I have about really being vulnerable with my mate, with a man, um, and allowing a lot of my emotions that we'll get on to later. But distance was one, and closely linked to that, was control. And that's been a big pattern in all of my relationships with men and especially with my, in my relationship with AJ. So a desire to control what happens, a desire for us to stay like this, thank you very much, and not go that far and not go that far. Let's keep this, I want it to be controlled. I want to know what's going to happen next. I want you to make me feel safe in this place. So can you already start to feel what I'm avoiding? 
What am I avoiding through my control and desire to keep it like this? Fears, fears. There's a lot of fears. And behind my fears are my actual, let's say, causal emotions. So my causal emotions with my soulmate consist of lots of things. They're my soulmate grief. Or my grief with my dad. Obviously with AJ I have some grief that relates specifically to him and our separation. Um, for people who aren't reincarnated, so it's a lot about our dads or our mums or whatever part, whatever gender our partner is, our preferred part, our soulmate is. So my soulmate grief is in there, my dad grief. There's also my soulmate love is actually behind here. This is what I'm avoiding, this vulnerability, allowing my heart to open. So I've known about this for a while. <laughs> I've known that I've got these issues and that I'm avoiding these causal emotions. And sometimes I'd try really hard and I'd crack over into some causal emotion and I'd have a big cry <laughs> and I'd have a big cry and things seemed to be a bit okay. What I realised was that I was avoiding my fear. And it wasn't just fear. It was like this. It was a brick wall <laughs> of terror. Utter terror. How's my brick wall looking? <laughs> It's all in the diagram. I love the diagram. <laughs> so let's call this my brick wall of terror. I'm actually terrified of going to this place. I'm terrified of opening my heart. And because I feel that it's impossible, I have built this brick wall of terror. So now what happens? What happened, what was happening for me very commonly, and it happens to all of us, either because we live with AJ or we're on the divine love path and someone tells us. <laughs> okay, not many of you have that example, but <laughs> you have a discussion with AJ, or your law of attraction does this. It shines a light. <laughs> Sorry about my handwriting on this addiction. We have an awareness, oh, I've got an addiction. Or somebody tells us, oh, I've got an addiction. Now, in that moment, in that space, we have two choices. We can choose to deal with the addiction, or we can choose to avoid. Now, what was happening for me <laughs> was I had a huge belief linked to my brink wall of terror and underpinning my addictions, which was, I cannot deal with, experience, and almost contemplate terror. That's it. Terror, the emotion. I felt like I can't go there. It's just impossible for me. So because of that, the light would be shone on my addiction. AJ would point out, gee, you've been controlling. I would recognise, wow, we've come close and then I've stepped back and it hurts. There's distance between us again. I'd recognise I have this addiction. I would go to deal with it and then because I had this belief, I cannot deal with or experience terror, I immediately went, oh, it's all locked down. And I was so locked down to the point that I wasn't even acknowledging that I had terror. I was just like, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And so what happened then was that I went over into avoidance territory. And this is, this is where the damage can really happen and it's been really powerful for me to examine the different things that I do in avoidance. So, can anyone think of what are some of the things you do when you avoid your addictions? There's a key one. <laughs> Eat, yeah. Uh, Katrina? Self-judgment. This was my favourite. 
my favourite. Actually, I should, I should clarify that, but we'll put it first. Self-punishment. So I'd go, oh, I've got this addiction, I can't believe it. I've done it again, I've ruined it, I, we've gone away again, I've stuffed it up, I'm such an idiot. Wow, when am I ever going to get it? Pray to God, when am I ever going to get it? And what I was doing was getting very, very far away from my causal emotions. Remember, all self-punishment is a self-deceiving emotion anyway. You're just getting further and further away from how God feels about you and further and further away from the real truth of what's happening. Now, I have to clarify because my favourite when I met AJ was this one that many of us do. Anger. <laughs> like that big. <laughs> so every time the light was shone on some addictive thing, something that was out of harmony with love, I wanted to get angry back. And many of us do this every day. Our law of attraction brings us something that is actually shining the light on an addiction and we get angry back at the situation or the person. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to be around that person again. And we're actually pushing away the messenger of truth and we're getting far away from the causal reason we've attracted it. So anger was, anger was my first preference. <laughs> Second, when I realised my anger is so unloving, I want to stop being angry. It's not my partner's fault that I'm in this place. I'll stop being angry. What did I do? Internalise the anger and got angry at myself. Equally damaging, or perhaps not as equally damaging, because when I'm angry at him, I'm damaging not only me but him, but I'm still damaging myself when I'm self-punishing. So I had anger, self-punishment. Another one was a desire to run away. Now, lots of us do this, don't we? Oh. It's too hot in the kitchen, there's too much truth going on here. We don't call it truth, do we? It's too confronting. I need a break. I need to go away and just process my emotions. It's all about running away from the truth and staying away from the causal emotions that are actually being triggered. Or they're not being triggered, we're still avoiding them by being over here. Uh, and the last one is really an extension of the anger, which is to abuse others. Uh, many people do this in this space. We, we desire so much to stay away from the truth of what's happening because remember we have this underpinning belief that helps us justify not only keeping the addiction but creating the unloving behaviour. We believe I can't deal with or experience my terror so that justifies my addiction. I can't possibly change and also I'm going to resort to these things and feel like it's okay because I feel like I can't do anything else. And we're deeply in error in that place. Is everyone following along so far? Yep, yep, okay. So what I realised was that I was doing all of these things. I'd still remind myself about these things and sometimes try and jump over there, but what I was avoiding was this, the experience of terror and fear. And actually what was happening and what can happen, I'm getting a bit messy here, so I'll just... <laughs> what very commonly happens in this situation is we, the light is shone on an addiction. We go, oh, I, I should deal with this, I'm going to deal with this. We get this far and then, whoa, I'm too afraid. So we come back and we're immediately in these unloving behaviours. And what happens when we do that? Every single time we do that, we have reinforced this belief. I can't deal with terror. I just tried and I couldn't do it and whammo, I'm back here and whoop, let's punish myself for that. And also what I did in that place, I just added some more bricks. I agreed with myself. I said, yep, I can't do it. And next time I go back, because I not only have the, the um, erroneous belief, but I also have the experience of trying to go there and not doing it, oh, my brick wall got higher, it got bigger, it got stronger. Do you see what I mean by that? Yeah, I didn't challenge the fear, I didn't experience the fear, so I went, yep, it's too hard. I'm going back, and next time I go back here again, I go, remember that last time I couldn't do it either. So it seems even more insurmountable. <coughs> Just going to have a drink, Ray, did you have a question? No. So 
So what I realized that I had to do was to pray about a willingness to experience terror. Because the other really damaging thing that was happening in this place, when we hang out over here, what can happen here? Any ideas? You get stuck, you get demoralised, you think, I'm not getting anywhere on this path. I see the addiction, oh, I think I've got to process the anger, I've got to process the anger, when really I'm in total avoidance of the fact that it's about terror. And yes, I might have some capping, causal, childhood anger, attached to this grief. However, can you see how far that anger is from this anger? And it's totally different in its experience. And you will go through some fear, likely, to get there. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. The thing that can happen over here that a lot of you are experiencing is this. Spirit influence. Spirits love this place. I'm, in to I'm not only in addiction, I'm in total avoidance of my addiction. I'm angry, I'm, I'm getting angry at others, spirits love that. Getting angry at me, spirits also love that. I'm even willing to abuse others sometimes to avoid what is there, to avoid really looking at myself. I was getting to this point, looking at myself going, whoa, there's so much there. I'm really avoiding a lot of intimacy in our relationship. And then because I, was having, I had this core belief, I can't experience terror, I was rapidly into one of these things. To the point where I was like, oh, I can't do it. I've got to run away. I can't. And that was all me just avoiding sitting with this and allowing the terror to build in me. To know that I'm going to go this way. So what's happened for me in the last couple of weeks is that I have started to physically experience terror. Now, in the past, I have known that I have terror or I have fear and I'll just lie in the bed and I'll try and shake it out. <laughs> this is not like that. <laughs> so I'm staying, I'm reminding myself of the truth of the situation all of the time, of what is my addiction, what is really over there, how big does that wall feel to me. I'm breathing a lot and I'm allowing whatever happens to happen. And I am doing some shaking and a lot of crying about that. But it's very different to... I was getting into a space where I was thinking, I have to just... This is... I have, must have to just bash a pillow for a long time. This is what it's all about. And it wasn't at all. Or I'd get into these really dark, self-punishing places and think, wow, like... What's going on? I feel so far away from God. I feel so far away from my mate. I, this, this can't be right. But I just simply was avoiding this truth that was, that was making me feel like it was all justified, that my unloving behaviour was justified because I, just, I can't deal with terror. It's an impossibility inside of me. Hmm. Does anyone have any questions? Joy? Um, obviously, people, we can have brick walls of terror about anything, not just this. Yes, and that's what I meant to say in the beginning. This is just an illustration mm. of a very common pattern of what happens emotionally for most of us around a lot of issues. And, yeah. and the question, other question was, um, so any time that I experience anger, am I avoiding an addiction? No, because remember I said, you can have anger over here. But remember, our childhood anger is essentially an avoidance of our childhood grief. But sometimes we were so shut down in our grief and in our anger, we need to experience the anger to let it come out. But there is a, there's an important thing to note about anger. All anger is really an avoidance. So if we're spending a lot of time in anger, if we're bashing or we're huffing or we're punching or whatever it is, to if we're spending a lot of time there, yes, we are in avoidance of deeper emotions. When we click into this childhood anger and experience it, it, we will rapidly, if we're owning it, we will rapidly go into our causal emotion or our grieving emotion, the next layer. How would you describe the difference between that anger and that anger? I, that's a good question and I want to talk about anger a bit today because this anger, there's very definitely a feeling towards somebody else. Like blame? 
blame, I want them to change, I want it to be different, this is not, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming out of me. When, and sometimes when we start to look at our childhood emotions, there's that going on. There's this feeling like against our parents. Now that is not, we're not truly processing in that place yet. When we connect to real childhood anger, there's a feeling of like, I just have rage inside of me and I've got to get it out. I personally am owning it. There's nothing coming out of me towards other people. Sometimes I might say some words and boom, I'm in it. I'm in this feeling of like, I just, this, I can't believe this happened to me. I, this feels horrible for me. And I'm experiencing that and letting it go. Just be very, like, I've had a long, hard lessons with anger of feeling like, oh, I just have to bash and then not getting anywhere. If you're not getting anywhere, <laughs> think seriously about where it's coming from. Yeah. Slightly different question. Yeah. Um, and that is just learning to feel what it is that I'm feeling. Like, I feel, don't feel right, but I'm not too sure what it is. Yeah. So the question is, how, how do I... How do, yes, how do you just learn to feel what it is that you're feeling? As in where I am, or what it, what's going on for me, yeah. Look, I've had to have a strong desire for truth. I've had a strong law of attraction giving me feedback. But when you desire it, when you, the thing that was stopping me seeing this whole side of the board for so long was this belief. When I recognised this belief, wow. Like, this all came to me in two minutes, and I, I'm much more aware of where I am. So be aware of what your fears are. Why don't I want to know where I'm at right now? Am I resisting seeing my true soul condition right now? I've had so much resistance to that. I don't want to see how it really am. It's like, I think I do, but whoa, it's pretty hairy when you go there. Yeah. Yeah. Josh at the back had a question. I was just wondering, um, in that place where you, I can't do this, have you found that there's a childhood feeling there that you go through when you come to face that terror? I guess I feel like all through my childhood I was given the message that I can't experience my own emotions. So I'm not capable on my own to feel my own emotions. So I feel that a lot of this terror is sort of working through that. It's a feeling of like... Um, That's what the terror actually is. Yeah. I mean, there's additional things, and I should probably put them in here, that probably go like uh, mini blocks behind that... Like, obviously, for different sets of emotions, we have bigger walls of terror, and they do relate to the content of the emotion. Like, for me, there is so much grief within me that this... It does relate to the terror. Like, part of the terror is about experiencing the grief. Does that make so sense? So do you find that if you're, you know, in the shakes, there's that grief coming? Yes, coming yeah. immediately. It's like, oh, I can't possibly bear feeling all of that. I can't possibly bear all feeling that. Oh, now I'm starting to feel that, you know? So as you start to experience the terror, then the emotion, of course, because that's the block, isn't it? But for me, it has been working through this. I can't possibly feel any grief. I can't possibly feel any grief. Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my soulmate grief. I can't really... Feel. And so it's sort of... There's layers to it, if you like. There's a big brick wall for me. It's like double reinforced. And I was joking with Katrina the other day, saying it's like got spikes out and barbed wire and double reinforced, and then I painted a pretty mural on it because I just... I'm a nice person, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but there's, like, so I guess I'm saying there's many facets to my terror, yeah. But, it w but it's all coming now because I'm challenging this belief. I'm challenging with God's truth. And in the, in the end, when we're living in so much error and we're desiring to step closer to truth, we have to remind ourselves of God's truth. And that can open us emotionally. Otherwise, it's very tempting to get into self-punishment or get really lost along the way. Have to remind myself, actually, this is my error-based belief. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd... Not really. Oh, no, you got I more just questions. wanted to say that, um, like, I'm sort of, I've been feeling this stuff where I'm, I'm crying really heavy. I can't do this. It's too big. You know, crying like that. Um, 
and there was this space where I was in, in the last week where like I needed a teddy bear like I needed something to be help me through it yeah that's that's, that's sort of uh re, you know like but I felt it was positive like I felt like it was releasing. you were connecting more to a childhood feeling yeah but in the end you won't need a teddy bear yeah yeah and like I can see like from here it's like we're all capable of processing everything because we're built that way. I can yeah, see that. That's it's God's truth, yeah. Getting, getting that truth really here and going, well, we can. Yeah. And anything. to do that, we have to work through emotionally these deep childhood feelings that we can't. Yeah. But just be careful of telling ourselves the truth in the process. Do you understand what I mean about by that? So while I'm, while I'm um, going into it, I can get stuck in this, I can't do it, I can't do it, I just can't do it, I just can't do it. When God's truth is I'm designed to do this and I feel like this is insurmountable. And that's quite a different feeling. I personally feel my little kid feels like I can't do this, you know, as different to like I can't do it and that's it. Spirits love that I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's where a lot of hooks come in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. No worries. Um, yeah, Rachel? The other thing I'll just point out before Rachel asks her question is that in this place, like we can be going along on the path and progressing and progressing. We can hit an area where we have a lot of addiction, have a lot of addiction. And keep in mind, when we have so much addiction, it usually is indicative of the fact that we have a huge amount of terror, which is usually indicative of the fact that we have a huge amount of grief underneath. So we can hit the addiction. We have an erroneous belief. Whether it's, I can't deal with my terror, or I can't deal with my terror about this thing. We can then fall into the trap of getting into these things, and our condition can actually degrade. Can you see why? I'm actively choosing, remember all addiction is a choice and these things are an extension of that choice. I'm choosing to be unloving to others, I'm choosing to be unloving to myself. So I can actually degrade my soul condition in this place. Yeah. Okay, Rachel. What's the first thing you do to go towards that wall? What, what was the first thing that you did? You know? I started to pray about courage to feel my terror. I started to pray about, um, yeah, just recognising this whole truth, even intellectually, yeah. And every time I was tempted to go into these things, reminding myself, hey, this is actually about the brick wall. This is always about the brick wall, yeah, yeah. Growing your desire is so powerful, you know. Growing your desire to deal with, deal with things. Very often we feel like we're trapped. Um, but prayer was really powerful for me in this place. And specifically with AJ, I mean, can you talk about a sort of certain situation where what was going on and what actually happened and what you did that changed that, or that <laughs> too? <laughs> um, I think I had, a, we were lying in bed one morning and we were discussing um, what was happening in our relationship that I was still staying so distant that I and I was crying feeling like I can't do it I can't do it I can't do it and AJ was pointing out that I was in these things and and I suddenly real and that I was very afraid and I suddenly realized whoa this is this is what I'm doing this this whole thing literally downloaded to me I was like oh my gosh and this is how far I am away from that that's, it's like literally at the other end of the board. Any emotion I'm feeling in here is totally at the other end of the scale. Now, I wouldn't say that I'm through the brick wall of terror or <laughs> totally away from these things either. I still run away emotionally. I still feel like... But it's, I remind myself, oh, I've gone away. I've gone away again. And I usually have some feedback about that. <laughs> um, and um, remind myself this is about terror. Yeah, 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 yeah. Katrina? With, yeah, if you just keep your hand up. Suze is there, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about the Wall of Terror because I've begun the process of going through it, as you know. But what really unlocked it for me, specifically, if I could say, our situation, was my sexual relationship with Russell. My wall of terror was that 
I can't have sex with him because it's too scary. And AJ had a, and Mary had a talk with me about it. But what made me go away from running away and anger and blame into the wall of terror was AJ reminded me that it's an act of love to feel the terror. I was not loving myself yeah. by running away from the terror. And to stop running the story that, you know, that, 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 you know, it's loving to run away, to tell myself God's truth. If I experience all my emotions, I'm in a state of self-love, which was really bizarre to shake and scream and feel terrified like I'm going to die and say, this is loving Katrina, this is loving Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard, yeah. but I actually got through the brick wall on this particular subject and out the other side. And I'm not finished with it, but I've got into vulnerability and I've got into grief. And in the middle of the brick wall was rage and, and, and terror all mixed in together. I'm crying and I'm screaming and I'm flipping out in the bed and I'm shaking like a leaf and I'm cold to the bone. But the, the, the reminder that this is an act of love actually got me into it. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say the same thing for me. I, I had to desire to see the truth of how unloving I was being towards AJ. Like, I had to, to recognise that this brick wall of terror felt like my hardship, you know. I've got terror here, people, you know. It's really hard and scary, you know. This is my pattern. Like, feel sorry for me and my terror. And I totally did not want to see what I'm creating, what I'm putting on to people, what, not just AJ, other people, when I'm living in my terror, but specific, specifically with AJ. And, like, I... I'm still crying many tears about how much of this I have done and actually damaged the trust and love that, that was growing in our relationship. And when it grows and I fall back there, it feels devastating because now I'm desiring more to see the truth and, desiring, and also seeing how much my terror has just a negative impact on our growth. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Katrina. Philippa, did you want to say something? Yeah, Mary, I just wanted to ask about self-punishment. That's a huge thing for me. Yeah. And I just wondered if you could maybe share how you have handled that for yourself. Um, I, I used to cry a lot in self-punishment, especially when I first started, or about a year into when I started, when I started really crying, because <laughs> it took me about a year to warm up to crying. <laughs> um, um, I spent lots of hours crying, beating myself up emotionally in self-punishment. And it took me a while to realise that a lot of spirits were involved with me in that process and that I wasn't getting anywhere, like absolutely zero progress in my self-punishment. It was just nothing. I was the same at the end of the week as I was at the start of the week. And what I had to do was just start being really real with myself that any time I found myself in self-punishment, say, yep, this is wasted. This is wasted emotion. I would stop myself crying. And I still, like, I mean, many of you who know me know that I still have issues with self-punishment. But I, I no longer cry in it. That was like totally just helping spirits slow me down. And I began to feel them, like I would get almost rageful with myself, want to punch myself. And, and the more mediumistic I became, the more I realised, whoa, this isn't even me here. This is just a group of people coming to assist me to stay away from the real emotions. So I had to just be totally honest with myself at all times. Self-punishment is not loving me. It's not how God wants me to be. It's not how God is with me. It's not even how my soulmate is with me about these issues. And I started it as an intellectual process. I'm stopping that now. Thanks. No worries. Gary, if you want to go just along to the end of the row. Uh, Mary, so you've got all your addictions like identified, so I'm not going to be, I mean, anger, you know, that's off the list. I can't punish myself, I can't run away, and I'm not going to abuse others. Then you say, right, I've got to confront this belief about the terror. Yeah. And so, you know, I've sort of done that, and then I say, right, let's go to the terror, and all I can hear is the crickets in the background, you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of like... Yeah. What when you in, like in that, that very space though, and yeah. this is where you've got to be careful yeah, about punish. being yeah, self-punishing. That's again. what I do. Go into that. Yeah. yeah, you just slip straight back into it. It's okay to sit there and go right. I'm wiping this side of the board, and I'm just going to sit with this. I'm sitting with it. Well, yep. Still really afraid. Yep. Still, still don't even want to feel it. Yep. Can you see? I'm a lot closer 
to my causal emotion. If I get to here, it's like the, the cycle, we get to here again and we go, okay, I'm going to feel the terror. I'm not feeling the terror. Damn it, I'm an idiot. You know, <laughs> I've just gone back there. So right. it's okay to go, yep, not feeling the terror today, but I know it's there and I know it's real. I'm going to write about the terror. What is it? Start, if you're not getting it emotionally, start intellectually. Recognise where it's dominating your life, where it has dominated your life. Recognise, talk about the colour of the terror, you know, like really immerse yourself in the truth of it. Do you see what I mean? I don't mean make it the truth. I mean, what is the extent of my error? Yeah. And just pray as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. AJ told me a really beautiful thing a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's in our loo now, but it was um, pray to see or desire to see the extent of the addiction. That's the first thing. And until you do that, you, you're still living in la-la land a bit. You want to see the extent of this addiction and how big it is in your life. Recognise all the times you've done this, all the ways you've done this. I started a list of our relationship from literally the time that we met. How was I in addiction? <laughs> what did I do? What happened in that part of the road? Oh my gosh, and I avoided that and I was projecting it. I wanted to see the extent of the addictions. Then recognise the truth about the addictions. Am I going right, babe? Is this the right? I think I'm right. Addiction, truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're the speaker, darling. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have the desire to see the truth about the situation. So this is what I see now. This is the extent of my addiction. It's been ruling our entire relationship. What's the truth of what's really going on? Wow, I've got a wall of terror and underneath this I've got a massive amount of emotions. So desire to see the truth of what's happening. Be aware of self-punishment in these first two steps. Because these first two steps are what is required for you to actually access your causal emotions and connect to God. If you self-punish, you just keep yourself up. You just start another cycle and you need to go through step one and step two again. And then pray for the desire to feel the extent of the grief, the fear and the grief that's involved in that cycle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone else has a question? Uh, at the back, Max? Mary, I have um, had a couple of instances lately of um, waking up in terror in the middle of the night, and um, I felt trapped. Yeah. You know, I just went into a huge panic, and what came up for me was the fear of dying. And when you and you when you go into terror, so how do you get through that fear of dying? Because I just went into an absolute panic. Yeah, and what did you do in your panic, Max? Um, just pulled myself right out of the terror. Yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, two of my massive terrors, which are actually related to um, connecting fully with my soulmate, is about being tortured and being raped. So what I've been allowing myself to do is lie on the floor, lie on my bed, and just, it feels like waves to me, waves crashing mm. over me, and that's what you were starting to experience when yep. you woke up, yeah. of just terror powerlessness, terror, fear, and instead of my, my pattern has been to run away from that, shut that down, mm. busy myself, I've just been lying there and almost inviting the waves of terror. Okay, I'm just going to let this pass through my body. And as it does, I often convulse, sometimes I cry, and sometimes it just feels like literally I can feel the, um, I don't know if it's adrenaline or whatever, going through my body. Um, and just stay warm because you get cold in that process. Yeah. But just remember breathing because breathing locks a lot of our fear down. Whenever mm. I feel there's fear coming up, I just remind myself to breathe into this stomach place, use your whole diaphragm, and just let it crash over you. Yeah. And pray to God at the same time. Yep, yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because a lot of us feel that we can't, we can't possibly experience that emotion. And the exciting mm. truth that I can now say to you with certainty is that we can. <laughs> like three weeks ago, I would have said, oh, I don't know about that. But you can, you can go through it and out to the other side of it. Yeah. yeah. But just allow yourself to stay in that moment. Yeah. Mm. Stay breathing. 
Yeah, yeah. I just had another question about and this is about the anger. Yeah. Um, I feel like at the moment that I've had a real bend of anger and I've just been trying to express that whenever it comes up any time of the day. Um, not much. Is is it mostly childhood anger or is it is it because I'm a bit confused about what's real anger and is the childhood anger the real yeah. rage or is it to be expressed as So that this or? is where you have to be really honest with yourself. This type of anger that I'm talking about that I was going into was an active attempt to stop someone shining the light on my addictions, to change someone else's behaviour or change a situation. So there's this type of anger. It's a very adult sort of a rage yep. and sometimes it's quite quiet and seething but it's very definite. Stop doing that because I don't want to see the truth of this situation. So there's that kind of anger. Mm. There's the childhood anger that we talked about, which is like, the, it's usually where you've been shut down as a child in your grief. Yes. You felt angry and you've been shut down on that. So it's, it's got a childlike sort of an expression. Like it's not fair, you know, tantruming Tantrum. on the floor. Yeah. yeah. There is another type of anger um, that I have experienced, which is, it's like an adult tantrum, if you want to call it like that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to bloody do this, God, that kind of a tantrum. It's a block. It's a block to feeling emotion. Yeah, and it, I am avoiding emotion in that place, but I have had to do some experiencing of that kind of rage. So I'm not projecting, well, I'm projecting at God probably <laughs> in that place, and I'm just saying, I don't want to go there. This is really, I can see the truth on some other issue and I don't want to go there. It's too hard, you know. And I've had to feel some of that anger. But in, the truth is I didn't have to feel it. It was part of me. You have to desire to want to go to the fear and the causal because you can sit in that place for a long time. Do you see what I mean? Like you, if you don't desire to go underneath that, you can just stay in that sort of rageful, cranky place for a long time. And I did do that for a long time. Some of us have a fear of anger, a fear of this childhood anger because we were punished so massively for it. And some of us do need to go through this childhood feeling of anger in order to get to our childhood grief because it's real. It exists within us as a capping emotion. So there's anger that's a cap, that's real already within us, and there's anger that's an avoidance, a denial, a rebellion, that kind of anger. So that's where you have to be quite sensitive to what's happening for you. Can you feel what's happening for you? I just feel I have this rage inside me all the time. Yeah. And like my whole life I've been, I feel very, very hot all the time. Yeah. I can feel it now. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and I, I've never known what it's about, but I've realised lately that it's got to be anger because that's the heat. Yeah. And I don't anger know. or shame. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite likely that there's some childhood rage. That oh, that's what it feels like. But as you're experiencing it, remember if I'm really owning this and I'm really desiring to go deeper, my grief is going to start to surface. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, thanks, yeah. Mary. Right. Uh, yep, anyone else? Here. Um. When you talk about breathing, I've become aware of a number of physical actions that will shut my emotions down. Mm -hmm. And breathing seems to be one of those. It shuts you down? So you mean like a calming sort of a breath? Yeah. yeah. If, if I start to feel my emotions come up and I think just breathe through it, I'll just feel myself going to this nice, calm, peaceful... Yeah. And that's where you've got to be real with yourself. That's, that's hooking into your resistance and avoidance, that type of breath. So when I say breathe, remember the intention is the key thing. If, I, if I'm really afraid of my um, emotions, I'm going to want to lock them down. Now, some of us who've done a lot of relaxation and meditation and things like that can do a calming breath and actually come out of the emotion. Just recognise that at that moment, I'm resisting this emotion. When I'm going to go into my emotions and I want to, I will stay breathing. Especially fear seems to be the thing for me that locks down my breath. We were watching a movie the other day and AJ said, just breathe, just breathe, because I was sitting on the couch not breathing. So that's very different, yeah. yeah. I, I use my intention very strongly when I'm processing. So 
if, if your intention is to get out of your emotion and you breathe, you're going to get out of your emotion. Yeah. Yeah, there has been times that's been used, if I'm feeling angry and just breathe so I don't take it out on everybody around me. Yeah. Rather than telling yourself just breathe, why don't you pray? Do, do you see? Like you could say, okay, God, there's an emotion coming up for me. How do I feel about it? Talk to God about that. If I tell myself just a blanket statement, just breathe, I'm not really desiring to see the truth of the situation. Do you see? If I desire to see the truth, if I desire to know what's happening inside of me, I'll use my breath in a way that's going to assist me. Yeah. But when, there's no, uh, like if I have a blanket rule, I'm just going to breathe. I can avoid, actually, I don't want to feel this, or actually I've got anger on top of this, or I'm afraid of this thing and I'm just trying to do the grief, but I'm just breathing. And it's, it's sort of taking me away from feeling what's really happening. So pray along with it that the emotion will flow. And yeah, be of and be real with yourself if you want the emotion to flow. Because sometimes I've kicked into this grief place and as I said, I've avoided the brick wall of terror and really I needed to focus there. So I can be praying with all my little heart, I want to feel my soulmate grief, but that might not be the truth. <laughs> the truth might be I'm actually terrified right now and this feels completely overwhelming. So I, I would talk to God about that. Be real with yourself and pray about what's really there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Who else? Um, Janet? I was just going to make a comment. Sometimes um, what I've found is if I quicken my breath sometimes, it, it actually accelerates the emotion or um, yeah, brings it up more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And when I breathe in my terror, I'm not trying to take a slow, deep breath. I should clarify that. I'm just trying to fill this space in my tummy that's locking down. So sometimes I can't manage a big, deep breath because I'm really afraid. So it's a small breath, but I'm trying to fill my stomach. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's similar to my question. I find that they often will come into a <laughs> kind of thing and I... Uh, but nothing really happens, so it's and I'll shake all over. But I feel sometimes that I'm actually creating the shaking yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah, and that's where you have to be. Yeah. Like when I'm the terror I've been experiencing lately feels very. I'm feeling afraid. As I would, I would sometimes get triggered around fear and go into shaking, and then just be sort of shaking and might go somewhere else, you know. And but I'm still shaking. But hang on, this doesn't feel quite right. When that's happening, you're not experiencing the terror. You've started, but you've, you've lost it somewhere along the way. So, and that is where I do focus on my breath again and the, the feeling that triggered this situation. So this breath where I'm panting sort of thing is, what's that? Um, well, I think that's you locking... If you're in fear, you're locking down your diaphragm and staying up here with your breath. Okay. Yeah, so I'd focus on trying to get down there again. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, Jen. In my childhood experience, I learned to leave my body. So my yeah. addiction is, you've only even got to say the word terror and I'm gone. Mm -hmm. um, I find now I'm in so much anger and fear of that anger, but I'm still in the addiction of leaving. Can you help me know how I to I think, Jen, this is where you have to be honest with yourself. When you say you're afraid of the anger, you're not afraid of the anger. You're feeling comfortable in the anger because it's keeping you away from the terror, and you have a lot oh, of terror. okay. Yeah, yeah. So first, so tell yourself I, the truth. So how well, learn to stay, you know? That's up to you staying connected with your body. Now, I have this problem as well of just, whoop, I'm out of my body, especially when I'm um, feeling afraid socially. Uh, suddenly, I'm not connected to myself at all. And I think, oh, where am I? Like, so it's being, firstly, like I said, recognising the truth of what's happening. Staying aware of that. Recognising when I go to anger, I'm still avoiding this terror place. And even, like I said to Gary, even if I'm sitting here and going, I'm really terrified, whoop, I'm out of my body. Okay, I'm going to get back in my body. Whoop, I'm really terrified, now I'm out of... 
keep reminding yourself of the truth. Where am I at? Where's my body? Focus on your breath. Do things that move your body physically also. So you start to get the sensation of when I'm in my body, when I'm out of my body, what that feels like. And recognise the times when you suddenly out of your body. What was happening right then? I can deal with, there's obviously a specific terror there, and I can deal with that in lots of different ways. I can set my intention and my desire to actually go and deal with those things instead of getting into the situation again and going, oh, I'm terrified, oh, I'm out of my body again. I'll leave that until next time I get in that situation. Instead, if you really want to deal with it, focus on, okay, when I'm in a social situation, I go out of my body. What am I afraid of? What is the fear all about? Okay, how can I challenge those fears? Rather than avoiding the fears, how can I get myself into more social situations? <laughs> and that's what it feels like. What, I'm actually going to actively seek out these things? But this is so powerful. It is so powerful. Yeah. Thank you. At the back there, Jen. Other Jen. In this past week, I've certainly been trying to um, get into that wall of terror and I'm getting absolutely nowhere because I have uh, a belief also that uh, if I do go through the terror, nothing's going to change anyway. Um, the belief that I've tried everything and nothing ever changes. I never seem to get to the golden star at the end of it. So I'm realising now that that's an addiction of mine, that belief system. Yeah. So my question is, can I sit at my wall of terror and actually do the two things at the same time? Just pray to God for more faith to, oh, that it's going to change at the end of it? For me, the way through the brick wall of terror has been reminding myself of the truth. At the moment, you're reinforcing an untruth to yourself. You're saying, my fear is a reality. If I go through this, it, nothing's going to change. And you're saying, I've, I've got past experience. That helps me justify my fear. And this is a really common pattern that, like I have and a lot of women I know have, I, um, of feeling like fear is truth. That's it. I'm afraid of it. It's definitely going to happen. That's not the truth. And it feels like I got quite irritated when AJ started telling me, well, no, that's not going to necessarily happen. Well, especially if you deal with your fear, it's really probably not going to happen. Like, no, how do you know? It's happened to me. I'm afraid of that and I'm allowed to be afraid of that. And can you see it's very negative. I'm, I'm wanting to reinforce the untruth to myself. And at the moment, that's where you're sitting. You're reinforcing the untruth to yourself and it's stopping you going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have um, um, a situation in my childhood where I was in terror because of the physical experience that I was going through at the time. Um, now I'm half willing to go and deal with that because I can go and sit on a roller coaster down at SeaWorld in a couple of weeks' time and really feel the terror of being totally out of control physically. But I'm also frightened that if I get into that terror, I'm going to cause the roller coaster to actually crash and then I'm going to be, you know, really physically hurt. So remember, this is another place where you've got the same pattern going on. Mm. My fear is real. My fear is real. Mm. Remember, our law of attraction is the strongest when we're in denial of the emotion. When I'm actively seeking to experience the emotion, God doesn't have to send me another messenger of truth, does he? Mm. I'm wanting to go there, I'm starting to experience it. That's the shifting point of when our, once I've dealt with it, my law of attraction changes. You're just talking about it, I'm just so frightened of yeah. just yeah. going anywhere near it. But I, I do want to hop on that roller coaster. Yeah. I really do. I know I'm going to be absolutely petrified. But I also want to know that things are going to be good once I get off it. Well... Uh, you need to go through the fear of it, Jen. Remind yourself of God's truth about the situation. So God's truth is God designed me to handle any fear. I can handle my fear because God designed me that way. Most of us have this belief, I can't handle my fear and my fear is a reality. Both things are untruths. Okay, thanks, Mary. Yeah. yeah. 
Also, Jen, remember to focus on the person. There's some feelings about being physically out of control that you're triggering on the roller coaster. But there was people involved in this terror, wasn't there? Yeah. So don't neglect those things. Because usually there's the bigger terror, is the emotions that were coming at us during this experience of feeling totally out of control physically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Deb? Um, Mary, I'm, um, I feel like I'm in the middle of um, a grief around my mum, around my soulmate not being with me and around um, aborting my baby. I feel like it's just never going to end. And, um, yeah, I just wonder if you've got any tips around that. Around just the feeling? The, the like feeling I'm of in... it's never going to end. And I'm willing to go for as long as it takes. If it takes an entire lifetime of crying... I'm willing, but I kind of don't have any perspective, you know, that it's... Um... And this is part of the block, Deb, and I have this block as well. If I submit totally to my grief and despair, it will never end. That is actually a block to you fully experiencing and releasing this emotion. Can you feel what I mean by that? While I have the feeling like if I totally submit to this, it's never going to end. I'll just be a sad sack for the rest of my life. You can see while I've got that block there, it, it, it will never end. I might have this big ball of grief that I'm ducking in and out of, but while this is blocking me, I'm never going to submit totally to it. So avoidance. work on that. That's a, that's a block that you can work on emotionally. This, and it very likely came from your mum or your dad, a feeling like you just can't be sad all the time. You've got to get on with your life, that kind of thing. Or a very sad parent who felt like, I need someone with me to help me go through my grief. And in reality, whenever we want someone with us, we're never going to go totally through it anyway. You want me to tell you it will end, <laughs> but you need to go through the emotion of it will never end. <laughs> God's truth is, of course, it will end, but it will only end when you totally commit and submit to feeling it in its entirety. And then you won't, ironically, as soon as you do that, you will have a deep and certain knowledge in your soul that this is leaving me. I can feel it starting to change. Yeah. But don't be hard on yourself about having this block. Most of us have it. Just recognise it as a block to my full submission to the emotion. Yeah. Okay. And the other part of the other question was around fear. I, I feel like I don't go through much fear, um, except that I had a session with Dee the other day, and I did get into quite a lot of fear. So I'm just getting that that's connected with that, you know. Because I there's generally fear go on top to of grief, that, yeah. you know. But then, and I don't feel any fear. I'm willing to go to the grief, but. I'm onto myself that I'm skipping over fear. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bruce? Hello. Um, when I go into some of this, I it, I go to a point, and I think I'm I'm asking for God's help. Yep. And then I feel like I'm connecting to God, and and then I'm I'm off. I think. <laughs> but when I come back, I I know I'm probably more gone off with the spirits. Spirits. Yeah. But I got a crack a headache. Is that, like, is that an avoidance? Is that my... The cracking headache is you suppressing the grief. Right. So you start to step into this emotional process, yeah. you start to open up, and then because you're very mediumistic and because there's still some resistance within you, you, you get, and if you be more conscious of what's happening as you start to step into the grief, you'll start to recognise the feelings that start to surface right before you're off somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, and it might be something like Deb's like oh, I can't go into this, it'll never end, or this feels really out of control, or whatever it is. And that just constitutes a block 
that's a block that you need to work through. What's happening is you get to that point, your spirit buddies go, don't worry, Bruce, let's go on a, you know, a fun-filled adventure and we'll call it God. And, and then you have a lovely sort of metaphysical experience and then you come back and go, my gosh, my head hurts. And that's because the grief got totally suppressed in that process. I sort of I get in these feelings when I go there that I'm actually feeling it rise up the back of my neck like that's how I'm sort of getting these sensations that, as it's happening and I'm, I'm sort of catching myself yep. sometimes sometimes yeah yep. so you're recognizing oh hang on there's yeah. some kind of suppression happening yeah. here yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks yeah. no worries all right anything else no, no? someone said <laughs> at the back there's a question Mary, can you tell me just how safe this can be? Because when I started going through my terror, it was grabbing me by the throat and it got to the stage where I almost passed out and I was vomiting all over the place and I think I pulled myself out of it after a while because I, I can remember calling out, oh no, oh no, no more. And I think I pulled myself back out of it. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, when you said it was grabbing you at the throat, what of do you mean? Choking. Something was choking me at the throat. Yeah. Yeah. So do you feel And that I couldn't breathe, I couldn't think. And I, was, I felt as if I was passing out, but that, that was just a little later. Yeah. So it wouldn't be from the grabbing of that. So I feel like a few things are happening for you. You're still feeling like I can't deal with my terror. I can't do it. There's, there's that core belief within you. As you start to go into your terror, I think some spirits become involved with you and give you terrifying experiences, which just reinforce the belief. And then also you go into a sense of panic, almost like a panic attack, yeah, and it shuts you down. Recognise when I'm in a panic attack, I'm not submitting, like I was explaining to Max, I'm not allowing it just to wash over me. I'm still, I'm basically shouting out in my head, I can't deal with my terror, I can't deal with my terror, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And when I do that, I'm going to attract a lot of spirits that will help me continue feeling that. And I'll, I can also go into a full-on panic attack. What I need to keep reminding myself is of God's truth. God created me to handle my terror. I can handle terror. I can handle any fear that I have. I, and what, if I pray to God during this process and I have a desire to feel my terror, it will overwhelm me, I will experience it bodily and then it will be gone. I might throw up. The other day I nearly threw up just from feeling terrified. But as long as I know I can handle it and it's okay and it's leaving me, I'm okay with throwing up. Some of us go, whoa, now I'm throwing up and I'm convulsing and this is really freaky and I can't handle this and we shut it down. Yeah. Does that help any? Yes, it's just that I, I had gone through hours of terror and finally I, I did ask God, I said, is this it? Because I started to come back to myself. Now, and just be aware that... I straight away went into, into more of it. When you are experiencing your terror, you will be with yourself. And this is why I'm uh, saying that I feel that spirits are becoming involved with you in this process. You will feel, you will be in your terror going, I am terrified and I feel afraid and this is overwhelming. You will be connected to yourself, your own body, this is my experience. So when you're having this feeling of like, well, I'm coming back to myself, I just feel, really pray about your willingness to experience your terror. At the moment, not since that, I haven't been wanting to. Yeah. yeah. What I'm suggesting to you is that you weren't experiencing your terror. You were having a terrifying experience which was helped by spirits. Mm. How can I shake them off? I mean, they've been hanging well, around so long. That's what I'm saying. You need to have a sincere desire to challenge this belief within yourself. And even if you're like Gary in the start and go, I've got a brick wall of terror and I feel I can't experience it, and sit with that and pray about that and tell yourself the truth about that, write about what it is I'm afraid of and desire to experience my own terror, then you're going to start to move into your own terror. When you are sitting there going, I can't experience my terror but I really should and I'm going to be okay, right, right, and that's when spirits can become really hooked into the process with you. 
And when I'm afraid of spirits and I'm, I'm feeling like I can't handle my terror and God, is not going, God didn't create me to do this, spirits can get even more hooked into that. Have you tried processing just your fear of the spirits? The other day what I did was I lay on the ground and I instead of I feel a lot of spirit projection towards myself and AJ. Yes, I do too. That's quite violent and yucky. And usually I'm trying to block it out all the time. I lay on the floor and I went, I'm going to let it all in. It was terrifying. I lay there and I felt like literally they were this close to me and I just allowed my absolute terror to wash over me. That is experiencing your terror. When you feel like you're out of yourself and you're having these kind of other experiences, I feel that spirits are very much hooking into your fear of them and your fear of your terror. Yeah. It's, you can do it. God created you to do it, to be able to do it. I seem to have so much opposition. And this is why I say maybe focus on the feelings around that. Focus on your fears around spirits. Focus on this feeling that everyone's against me. They're blocks to you actually just purely experiencing your own terror. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? We'll leave it at that today. Is anyone feeling terrified? <laughs> I feel so empowered having um, hit on this. Oh, there's someone with a question just here. Mary, after 19 months of engaging in this new spiritual practice, I just feel like getting a posse together to outlaw all these natural love spirits. It's, <laughs> it's really confusing me. I mean, how are we going to get peace on earth fighting something? Well, we don't want to fight it, but we're... We want in, to love it. We, we want to send them on their way to the light and that, but they don't seem to want to go, you know. It's, it's really confusing. And then you've got to deal with your own anger and stuff like that. Is there any, Can we get a band of celestial spirits together to wrap them up? <laughs> Like an Easter bunny, you know, wrap them up nicely and send them back towards the light. Because <laughs> I'm telling you now, there's bands of celestial spirits just ready and waiting to chat to our natural love, brothers and sisters. Anytime they have the desire, uh, they will be given lots of truth about um, God and the divine love path. But what's your emotion about <laughs> the natural love spirits? Because remember, when I'm not in a state of love with absolutely everyone and everything, there's an emotional injury inside of me. Well, maybe I watched too many hero movies in, as a child because I always thought that if you did something really good for the earth and for people, you know, you'd probably go to heaven for that, you know. But obviously that's not going to work because they have free will themselves and oh you mean if it's we'd be doing something really good by rounding up a posse and um shoving them all along their way is that what you mean well hollywood seems to be bent on making a lot of money out of these movies where there's a hero and yeah. i was wondering if there's any heroes in the celestial world that could come down to the natural love world <laughs> there's one in the corner of the room actually <laughs> there's two, actually. he seems to need a lot of help but anyway <laughs> So I, I did mean that with coming from the heart, but yeah, there is, a, there is an emotion there where it's like I'm find, trying to find time. Um, I had a really interesting session with Deanne the other day where I'm trying to find time. It's like I'm wasting my time. I, I want to get on with it. It's, there's this emotion where it's it, how do we fast track it? Because I remember AJ said earlier on, this is the fast track way. And I thought, God, what's the slow track way? You know? <laughs> hey, do you know what happens in the start of this path? The first 18 months, my gosh, my first 18 months were dealing with block after block after block. After. Remember I said it took me a year to start crying? I was angry about this and why did it have to be that way? And I don't want to, and my mum said you can't cry, all this stuff. And it feels like 
It's demoralising. I'm not getting anywhere, you know. But the truth is if I'm dealing with my blocks and if I have an earnest intention and desire to connect with God, wow, I'm making some real and lasting changes. What we're so accustomed to on this planet is quick, flashy changes. Hey, those guys are on the wrong track. Let's go and round them up and stick them on the right track. When really what this planet needs is love. <laughs> it needs to learn about what is love. And at the moment, there's a lot of error. There's a lot of error still in me. There's a lot of error everywhere around us. And it does feel like, wow, how, you know, and it feels like everyone's against us as well. The, the truth is, if we're going to be the light of love and truth on the planet, there's going to be, it's not here yet. <laughs> it's not here yet. So there's going to be a lot of opposition to that. And it's going to be slow wheels to get started. Imagine how cool it's going to be when all of us are at one with God. Yeah, How that's great. Rapid. One of my emotions is rescue, you know, and, yeah. and, and I'm still dealing with that. And, yeah, because yeah. the truth is that the only way I can rescue you is by showing you, becoming at one with God. You know, I can't, I can't bring you to every emotion and go, now feel that, and bring you to the next one and go, feel that. Because at the end, you'll go, well, I'm all right, but where's that chick who keeps showing me to feel? Like, I, you know, I, I need a rescuer. So working on my desire for that more would help with the, yeah. Yeah, and f working on your feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, like, well, I just want to see the change. Yeah. There's feelings of grief involved in that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> James. As the last speaker was talking about that, I thought, here's a whole room full of natural love spirits sitting here, learning that it's only us who can do it for ourselves. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Someone else had a question at the back. Is it Brian? It was more or less answered then, but <laughs> my question was going to be, what's wrong with natural love anyway? Well, yeah, and I was going to say that. Those people in the sixth sphere have got a fair amount of natural love, more than I've got right now. I'm not in the sixth sphere yet. Like, they're, they're not going to get angry at you and try and control you. <laughs> They've got some erroneous beliefs, but why wouldn't we have as much compassion or um, understanding and respect for those people as we would for anyone else on the divine love path. Yeah, yeah. And at the back. Um, Mary, I've missed a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, are you saying that, like, I, I imagine that every causal emotion or every real grief that we have, every, every error, there is a brick wall of terror kind of in front of it. Yeah, there's a terror, otherwise a terror. it would be flowing yeah. out of it. Yeah. There's a fear, yeah. otherwise yeah. it would be flowing out yeah. of us. Yeah. The issue is that some of us create massive addictions that are on top of the fears Yeah. that are on top of the causal emotion. Yeah, yeah. And it's a process of, yeah. like, recognising yeah. that, yeah. breaking that down. Yeah. Now, yeah. a lot of us, it's not a brick wall of terror. No. Like, some yeah. of us just have a bit yeah. of fear. Or, yeah. And some of us... Um, as we work through certain blocks about certain things, yes. um, like you, I can guarantee you when I'm through with my brick wall of terror with my soulmate, yeah. every other emotion is going to be a breeze. I'm yeah. going to work through a lot of blocks about what it is to feel other people's approval. This is a huge block. To be a woman who, wants, who desires to connect with her soulmate in a purely vulnerable, totally connected way... Yeah. I'm not only having to deal with my grief with my dad, yeah. there's a hell of a lot of women that don't like that idea. Yeah, that, right. And I, I want the approval of my mum still, so yeah. I'm going to have to deal with yeah. that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm dealing with lots of blocks. Yeah. If you go to your biggest fears, your biggest terrors and your biggest emotions, yes. yeah. you're going to progress the most rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I said to Jen, seek out the things yeah. that terrify yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. No worries. Okay. Would you like to add anything, babe? I can do, if you want. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll join you. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, Mary had a. Uh, Mary hasn't given you much background of all of that discussion, actually, um, as <laughs> Mary is apt to do. Um, but uh, Mary had sort of all of that sort of vision, if you like, come to her in, in a in a moment um, when we were discussing the whole process of addiction and addictions being choices that we make, and. One of the things that most of us don't realise is that all of our addictions are always a choice. They're something that we're choosing to retain within us. And um, we choose to retain our addictions because they feel like a more powerful place. And when I say an addiction, that most of them, of course, are emotional. So in other words, in my relationship with Mary, if I, if I want a woman to love me, then I am going to do things in my addiction to get Mary to love me and, I, and I'm unwilling to feel my own terror and my own grief that the woman doesn't love me. Right? So what I do, is instead of feeling my grief that the woman doesn't love me and then my fear of never being loved, I actually go into this addiction place of w earning Mary's love. Does that make sense? And as I'm earning her love, I'm now in the addiction. Now, in addictions, it can feel quite good. You can feel quite good in that place of addictions. Right? You feel like things are getting satisfied. That's why you get angry when the addiction isn't met. Because the anger is there because the addiction is being highlighted and no longer being satisfied. And as soon as the addiction no longer is satisfied, now what I want is the status quo to return. I want the status quo, which is the addiction getting satisfied, to come back. I want the addiction satisfied again, and so what I do is I project anger at the person who is not satisfying my addiction. Does that make sense to everyone? So, and when we were discussing it together, and, and Mary discussed it a few times privately with people about the blockage of the addiction, if, when Mary drew the, the big thing of addictions, right, we need to come to understand that they are choices that we are making. We are making the choice to stay in those addictions. And we make the choice to stay in those addictions so that we don't have to feel the terror and so that we can stay away from, as Mary drew, the causal emotions. And, and so what happens is every time something happens in our life, we have a choice. We have a choice to, as, uh, as we have said and as uh, Katrina brought up, we have a choice to be loving to ourselves even. And to be loving to yourselves really means being loving enough to yourself to feel every single one of your own emotions. That's how much love we need to finish up having for ourselves. That we're willing to feel every one of our own personal feelings. And that, so that is that direction. This direction, where we don't want to do that, is a choice too. A choice to not feel every one of our own personal emotions. That's the choice that we're often making. And, and the choice to go into anger, blame and all those other things are just ways for us to avoid the fact that we're actually in addiction. And, and that's what Mary was pointing out to you, I feel, a lot, a lot today. But can I just bring up something specific? And that is, terror is just... An emotion. The problem with it as an emotion is that we view terror as an emotion that's impossible to get through. But it is just an emotion. It's not a truth. It's just an emotion. And in fact, every fear is actually the opposite to truth. So, so we've got to remember that even our terror is just an emotion that all of us are capable of actually experiencing. And to, so therefore, it being an emotion, you're not going to be able to intellectualise yourself over it. You're not going to be able to avoid it. And, and can you imagine, every time, this is what's happening for many of you, is you notice your addiction... You do what Mary was said, you try to jump over into the causal emotion, you get a little dribble or two out, and of course the, the terror kicks in anyway then, doesn't it? And, and then we're going, oh yeah, I just can't seem to get there, I just can't seem to get there. Right? 
Now, can you see that if I feel the terror, then can you see what's going to happen? What happens? Can you see the wall that's preventing your emotions from flowing? If I, as I'm feeling my terror, the wall is disappearing, is it not? And as I'm feeling my terror, feeling my terror, eventually I will not be terrified about any of my emotions. And now what can happen? Now I can have a trigger event and I'm not going to get into addiction anymore because all of my addictions are caused by my avoidance of the causal emotion and the terror that I'm trying to do. So I won't have any addictions anymore. It'll, they will disappear. So at the moment, you might have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of addictions. Don't think that you have to go through every one of them to get rid of them. Because you don't. The reality is all you have to do is go through the fear that you don't want to experience that creates the addictions. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so if we're willing to feel that, those addictions cannot exist. And as sort of what came up just at the end there that I was sort of alluding to, that many of us have multiple addictions everywhere, like, like AJ's saying, so many of them, and we think, whoa, I've got all these addictions. The truth is all we have to do is feel the terror. And as I was saying, some of this terror is going to be the same terror for each addiction. So you're automatically reducing your hooks into every addiction. Some of them are specific. Some of them are related to what's on the other side of the causal emotion. So, for me... <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by that? I'm about to, yeah. <laughs> for me, I talked about, you know, I have fear about feeling um, my soulmate grief. But I also have fear about feeling my soulmate love and being in a total space of connectedness and vulnerability because I feel we'll be attacked So this is even the pure more. you, is it? This is the healed emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So, so some of my fears are about that thing. Some of them are just about feeling grief in general and some of them are about the specific grief. So the more that I deal with... I'm sorry, I've got all funny because you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> She's so good to look at. And then, when I, and then when I look at her, I get in trouble as well. You're not in trouble. Can you see I another just... edition in front of this? Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the more I deal with, like as AJ was saying, the, the, um, the terror about these specific things, as well as the general things, the more my wall's coming down for multiple. The general terrors lessen, the, lessen a lot of the addictions. Mm. Some of them are specific. Now, one of the things I, I thought while you were doing your talk was that you were asked a number of times for specific examples. And you quite often frequently avoid that process because of some of your own emotions. Yes, I do. But it would be quite powerful because uh, some of the spirits were actually prompting you to, through some of the questions to give specific examples in your own life. Yeah. And, and I sort of felt if you gave those spe specific examples that actually it would become clearer to, to everyone what was meant, yeah. about what is meant in any situation. I have, I have a feeling where I just go blank, uh, like I think... This is so real and I'm so passionate about it. Now, what's something that happened this morning? Um, so, can you remember what the question... The, one of them was about when I've used this in... Uh, well, I was thinking last Friday. Um, you, remember, you remember when I went out shopping and you, were, you stayed home? Yep. And I went out shopping because you were already in an addiction. Yep. So I went out and just left you in the addiction. Yep. And you remember you got into the state of feeling some of the terror. Sure. I was just thinking if we give some background to what's going on, to, to, to it, then people will understand it better, yep. like the principles. Yep. Uh, so last Friday we were having a discussion and AJ was relating how sad he felt about my continual withdrawal and distance from him. And I went into, ah, oh, self-punishment. And AJ went, look, this is not going anywhere. I'm going shopping. Because like, every time now Mary goes into self-punishment, the feeling I have inside of me is, 
Well, self-punishment is just the other direction. So here's my yeah. addiction, remember, that we drew. And when we make the choice, we go out to this... When we make the choice to even avoid the fact and come face to face with our addiction, we go into the, one of these emotions. And one of those emotions that Mary mentioned was self-punishment, self right? Of course, we, we also have the emotions of anger towards others. And now the emotions of, I want to blame somebody else, I want to punish somebody else, I want to make somebody else suffer. So that's, that's the emotion of anger towards others is I'm going to blame, punish, or su make someone else suffer. Self-punishment is the same kind of thing focused at yourself. So in other words, I'm going to blame myself, I'm going to punish myself, I'm going to make myself suffer. Right? Yeah. So, and, so, and Mary goes into that place, and my, now my instant reaction is, I can't, I can't stay with you talking about this anymore because you, you've just chosen to go in the opposite direction to your terror. Does that make sense? You've just chosen to go in that direction rather than this direction. And this is very insidious for me. I start going, yes, I need to acknowledge the truth of what's happening. I start to acknowledge it, then I go, oh, that's so terrible, and I immediately am in self-punishment. So AJ left, and I went... Uh, can I point out something about self-punishment yes. too, before you continue? Yeah. Um, self-punishment is actually quite egocentric. Very self-involved. Um, what, are they, what is it is very self-involved because what happens is when we're pointed out by somebody else has pointed out to us we're being unloving and then when we go into self-punishment we're still being unloving in that moment to the person does that make sense that we've just been unloving too in fact we're even more unloving now because we're avoiding our causal emotional reason why we were unloving before and on top of that now we're in this anger place with ourselves which is being unloving to ourselves but it's also in, by going into self-punishment where we're even denying inside of ourselves the connection to the person we've harmed. Yep. Does that make sense? And this is why when people go into self-punishment, you feel things are not resolved. Because the truth is they aren't resolved. Because that while the person's in a place of self-punishment, they will do it again, guaranteed. So let's say the act that somebody took was, you know, they just treated you unlovingly briefly for, for a brief moment, right? And then you point out to them that they, they were just treated you unlovingly. When they go into self-punishment, they are actually giving themselves the approval to do the whole thing again. You set up what's called a punishment a, a punishment reinforcement cycle. And there's psychological terms for it, actually. Where, where if you're willing to punish yourself, then you're willing to also go ahead and do it again as long as you're willing to keep punishing, punishing yourself. yourself. Does that make sense? And this is set up, you see this a lot happening in the religions like the Catholic religion, where there's huge amounts of guilt involved in the religious, the religious, religious practice. And what they're doing is the idea is, if I punish myself, then I can feel guilty, but then when I feel guilty, that's, I, I now can go off and do the same thing again as long as I'm just... willing to punish myself afterwards. Does that make sense? And so when you take away from yourself the willingness to punish yourself afterwards, you now come face to face with the deeper emotional reason why you've been doing that, and you won't allow that cycle to continue. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, so Sorry. what happened was, I, I'm aware of my chart now, and so as, as this thing was happening with AJ, we were talking, I went, no, I, I want to see the truth of what's happening. And I decide to myself, I want to see it. I start to see it. And then I very rapidly ping pong over here, over to here. And AJ goes, that's it. I'm going. This is non-productive right now. And, and I Better sat... off having a surf. <laughs> 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 or doing some shopping as I did that day. <laughs> More caring for me. But anyway, um, um, what I very quickly did after he left as I went, hang on. I've just done, I've just reintroduced the pattern that I've always had. And I, I went, okay, let's look at what really just happened and the truth of what happened. A big pattern in my family is that it's so terrible to admit that you've been unloving to another person. You should punish yourself and, you know, really beat yourself up because you know it's wrong and bad. And the other thing that has, um, that, is going on for me is that I have an emotional memory of being quite connected and loving towards AJ. And so when I catch myself being very unloving, I feel the, the 
contrast between the two states. I feel how it should, should be because this is how it was and it was so beautiful and then I feel how I have been and it just feels almost unbearable. It's not though, <laughs> that's my error. <laughs> and I, I immediately go into self-punishment. So I decide I don't want to do that anymore. And what I did was, instead of trying to skip to the causal emotion, which is my other pattern, what I would do is try and go to the grief, go to the grief, go to the grief. I went, I'm actually terrified. I'm terrified. It's okay to be terrified. And I did the breathing thing, you know, it's a good old um, breathing, which has never worked for me before, by the way. <laughs> but but, but this you, is where desire and intention is. What were you is, terrified so. of, though, babe? I was terrified of stepping closer to you. I was terrified of feeling. So step, terrified of having a closer relationship. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I sat there and I went, he's right. I'm so distant from him. That feels awful. I went into self-punishment. I'm an idiot. What's wrong with me? Then I went, that's not it. Mm. And I, so then I reminded myself, okay, let's just imagine you're going to be totally open, Mary. And did the breathing. <laughs> Before I did three, I was like this. I couldn't stand up properly. And I lay on the floor for the next hour and a half, allowing myself to feel I'm going to be connected with him. Spirits are going to attack us. We're going to be much brighter. And then everyone will come for us. I'll, I'll have to feel all this grief. It feels so immense inside of me. I can't believe I can fit it into my one body, you know. And I just let myself shudder and shake about that terror. By the time AJ got home, I was much softer. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I was through all of my terror, but I was much more open-hearted, wasn't I? Mm, yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 So one, one of Mary's deep core beliefs is that if she, if she joins with me again, that that's the beginning of the end of, for us. Does that make sense? Like, um, there is so much spirit attack now occurring, even from many times uh, our friends, uh, through, or through our friends, just through their different emotions. Um, there's so much spirit attack occurring now. Mary has this belief that if, we get in, if she gets into a better condition, there's going to just be more attack and more attack and more attack. Again, every new condition she improves to, she feels it more attack. So, so one of the core emotions that have been driving many, much of Mary's anger towards myself has been wanting me to get into a worse condition. If I'm in a worse condition, then we'll be attacked less, is, her, is the un underlying so It wasn't belief. very an intellectual process, but that's no. what was happening. And also a feeling of wanting to justify my fear. You can't tell me you're not going to die, because you're going to die, and I know, and I've, I haven't felt the feeling of it, so it feels even more real that that's going to happen. Mm. So we'll connect, and then I know, tick-tock, it's all going to be over. And like, is it, <laughs> I know. <laughs> But uh, hey, I've been pretty hard and harsh about this emotion. There's mm. been a lot of anger in me about it. Yeah. yeah. Of wanting to just, wanting AJ to commiserate with my fear, validate my fear. And, uh, and approve of it, like yeah. a, to actually agree with her. Yeah. So, so a period of six months of our relationship about uh, 12 months ago, Mary, every single discussion we had about emotion end up, ended up with, I'm not going to do this because... At the end of the end, you're going to die anyway and it's all going to be for nothing. Like, so it, it got back down to this same fear and I said, well, just go into that fear, just go into that fear. But, but by then Mary was generally in anger rather than fear and, yeah. and, 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 and staying in that place. There's a, it's, a huge, it's been a huge block for me to have somebody understand my grief and terror. You know, I, if you understand it, I feel valid and I'll feel it. But you should not, you should, you know, you should understand how this was really hard for me. This happened and it was bad and I'm afraid. And, you know, you can see what's happening energetically, hey? Big demand. And even when he comes, like what I was saying to someone earlier, even when he comes towards me and commiserates and goes, you're right, dear, that was terrible and it could happen again. And I, I'm just staying in my addiction and needing someone to go through it with me. And the truth is, I can't go through it if I'm needing someone else to be with me. I'm always going to be holding on to them. I have to let go of them and then I will submit to the emotion. Let's point out something about terror. Terror is always about, actually, about the past. So if you can just remember this, that it's always about the past. But what we tend to do with terror is we tend to make it about the future. Can you see? Like, if we, if we can just acknowledge, yes, 
these terrifying, so for myself and Mary, a lot of terrifying events happened in our past. Um, for both of us, individually and together in our, in our relationship in terms of how they affected us. So a lot of terrifying events occurred that we now remember as, as, ter as terror, or I've been through a lot of it now, but Mary's yet to go through a lot of it. But it is in the past. But, but while the terror remains within us, what we have a habit of doing is projecting it onto our future. So, so for example, if you got hit by a car and you didn't do, like physically hit, well, your body hit by a car, you got partially ran over, <laughs> let's, let's say, right? And you were in hospital for three months in recovery, you know, you had your legs pinned and your hips done and it, like, all these other things happened to you and you slowly recover and 12 months later you can start to walk again and you imagine how much trauma you've been through now after this like, experience of being hit by the car and the trauma of the following painful experiences of your body getting readjusted so you can even walk again. And so you, you come out of the hospital. Now, it's going to be very, very tempting for you to, to, to not walk across the <laughs> to road. avoid crossing the road. Isn't it? Based on the past experience. And what we have a tendency to do is that because we become so embroiled in the past, we then project that past, because it's an emotion within us, we're now projecting that past onto our future. And, and as we project that past onto our future, what we finish up, we're deciding to do in that moment is to live our future like our past was or to live our future to avoid our past, which is a very, very damaging thing to our soul. And the more damaging your past, the more damaging it comes toward to your future. Right? Because you're projecting it onto your future something really powerful that you explained to me because I, I have um, yes a lot of terror in my past and have wanted to believe that it's it's real like I was saying before defending it like it's really going to happen AJ and I know it and what AJ said to me and just to extend his analogy about the person who got hit by the car the truth is the person who got hit by the car and got totally pinned and whatever, went through a lot of personal pain, when they go to cross the road, they're going to be fairly aware of the cars, aren't they? <laughs> but I... And so they have a new... Um, they've been through something. They have a new level of awareness. Very often we go, nah, all cars are just going to come out of nowhere. And the truth is, like, if we've been hit by a car, we're actually going to be more attentive to the cars. If we've experienced the emotions that caused us to be hit by the car, then we're going to be very perceptive about the state we're in when we're even crossing the road, let alone the cars. And what I was doing was saying that terror in my past, men are going to harm me, it's going to happen, it's real. And AJ said, you're never going to be that person again. You're never going to be in that situation again. And if you deal with the emotions involved in this, you're going to be so sensitive, so aware of your own emotions, you're going to release your law of attraction and you're going to feel the people around you very clearly. But I still wanted to say, no, there's danger. And that's, this is why I was emphasising, tell yourself the truth. Be aware when you're lying to yourself constantly. Because it just stops you, it just shuts you down. So a lot of discussions we were having, Mary was trying to tell me constantly that what the terror, the terror events of the past always were going to happen again. Now, I can, I can certainly acknowledge the terrifying past. And I can certainly say to Mary and commiserate with Mary of the truth of how that past was terrifying, particularly for herself at the time. Does that make sense? So, so I can acknowledge that. But what I can't acknowledge is the untruth that it's all going to happen again. Because the, the, that all happening again is dependent upon us releasing the terror of the past. If we hold on to it, then there's a high chance that many of these things may happen again. But if we release it, the chances of it all happening again are very remote. Does that make sense? And, and the same applies to our, all of your lives in, with regard to all of your terrifying past experiences. To give you an, an idea of the extent of my terror, I actually got really angry at AJ for even just pointing out that initially when you told it, hey, I was so irritated I had to leave the table. I can't believe that. That's how From challenging memory she went it was. Out and 
pa- punched the bag I can't outside I just that. me stating the truth of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's – but that – And there was a lot of – he doesn't understand, terror. you know, going yeah. on there, wasn't there? There was yeah. a lot of – um, not wanting to feel the grief, the grief. of the of feeling that you did, I didn't end. understand. Yeah, mm. yeah. But mm. that indicates the level of the terror. Yeah. That's how resistive I was, yeah. And by the way, the size of the addiction indicates the size of your terror. <laughs> right? So, so if you find there's a certain area that you've got a very large addiction in, then that also indicates the size of your terror. By the way, it does not indicate the size of your grief because it's amazing how many times our grief is only this big but our terror happens to be this big <laughs> about feeling this much and and yeah. i think that our, that's because of a number of things some of the um, messages we're given as children but because many of us have come up to this wall and gone away from it again and come up to it and gone away from it again so we feel like it's ginormous and what must be behind it must be a monster when actually if, once we start to release it's actually terror building on terror yeah. so the only monster is really the the terror itself uh, that's often the monster and if you can get through that monster uh, from an emotional processing perspective if you can get through that you'll find every single other emotion you ever deal with is much much easier to deal with than that and and you'll feel pretty confident that you're going to be able to handle any emotion in your entire life and and this is one of the things that uh, we're we're, unfortunately we're not taught as children and that is we're not taught as children that terror is just an emotion just like any other emotion because most of the time our parents when they instilled the emotion of terror in us were terrified themselves and you you imagine you, you were just like little maybe two three years of age and you're looking up at this great big adult so you're down here looking up at this great big adult and the adults terrified what do you think you should feel like if the big person's terrified, then what should the little person feel? <laughs> right? And so what we do is we, we take on all that adult terror, we take on all that parent, parental terror, and it just absorb, we just absorb it inside of us because we feel we have to for a lot of different reasons. And so that terror, that childlike terror, dictates the rest of our lives. Oftentimes we are 40, 50, 60, 70 years of age and by the way there are two, some who are 1,000, 2,000 years of age in the spirit world still in this state of terror, of just, not, just avoiding and they're really just still in the childlike state of absorbing their mum and dad's terrified emotions which is sad when you think about it because there's a whole life they could have had without that terror, a whole life, yeah. Mm. So the reason why we wanted to discuss this with you is because we notice that many of you still are getting a little down about your processing work and getting a little down about where you are. Sometimes there's still a lot of going into this side of the equation, the, the anger, self-punishment, running away side, wanting to avoid side, you know, that side of the equation. And, um, and while you want to go into that side of the equation, you, you're not understanding you're making a choice to be unloving. Right? I'm making a choice, by going into this equation, I'm making a choice to be unloving to myself, to other people, but I'm still making a choice to be unloving. If I make this choice to come towards my real terror and experience it, you, it, you need to allow yourself to experience it, which is going to be bodily sensations and all sorts of things are going to be involved in the experience of it. What will happen is you start pulling down the wall rather than adding to it. So some of you are still adding to it by coming to, to the wall, feeling the wall, going, no, this is too much for me, going into one of these, which now then just reinforces the fact that you can't deal. And, and this is where prayer is so important. Like, at some stage, you, we've got to become reliant on God enough to understand that God has created her universe perfectly and therefore God has created everything in it perfectly and therefore, God has everything in hand, including, if I connect to God, my own terror. God's also got that in hand, as long as we're willing to give that over. And then what will happen is, down it will come, down it will come, down it will come. And can I say that this has just been um, so empowering for me. I, feel so, I have lived with this feeling, this belief that I cannot deal with terror for my entire life. And I've 
wanted to get to God and I'm okay, I'm going to deal with my soulmate emotions. The, an area of my life actually that I have the most terror about probably. Um, but having a let, like prayer was a huge thing, growing the desire to actually challenge this false belief inside of me and then allowing myself the bodily experience of it it, it is so trust me you will feel so amazing like wow it's not that it's not I'm not going to die if I feel that and I've started writing lists of all of my fears and ways that I can challenge them now I'd done that before but there was definitely a different sense inside of me this is why the breathing thing never worked for me I was like yeah nothing <laughs> yeah nothing <laughs> three times the other day and I was on the floor shaking so um, I would just really encourage you you know to really look have a sincere desire to look at what is my belief around terror what is my belief around terror desire to see the truth about that and then pray about it and challenge it challenge your fears in every area if you what is the most terrifying thing you can think of go well oh, how could I trigger that you know, how can I immerse myself more in an experience like that? That's, that's not unloving to myself, that's gonna, that I'm still going to be okay in, but that I can actually trigger the emotion that's sitting within me. It's so like heavy, the feeling when fear is just blocking you, controlling your whole life. When you start to break down the walls, it feels really good. Hmm. And one thing that uh, Mary's found is that... Um, She's had a lot of times when she felt that emotion of, I just can't do it, I just can't do it, I just can't do it. Many of you have felt that too in your, in your work on, on the Divine Love Path with, with your emotional work. Oh, I'm just not going to be able to do it. But the beauty of confronting your terror is that every time you do and you get through it, you realise, ah, I can do it. <laughs> it's very motivating. And it's a very, very powerful feeling, that. A very powerful, positive feeling, realizing, wow, I can actually do this. I can get, with God's help, I can do anything. And you get to this point where you start having some confidence, not only in yourself, but also confidence in God, because that's a part of this. When, with, when, we, when we're just re avoiding our terror, do you think we've got much reliance on God in that place? Not really. But if you can get through the terror and realize, wow, all I've got to do is rely on God and trust, and do and feel this emotion and I can get through all of it then it's very powerful very powerful and you, you'll come out the other end feeling really motivated so you know how you know initially when we asked you to write your fear list everyone goes oh yeah here we go you know, you know they write down you know they get to five or six in their list and they go oh yeah that's probably uh, that's probably it you know we're not very motivated to discover our fears once you hit this terror and actually process some of, the, of it emotionally, you're going to be very motivated to discover all of your fears. And because you'll realise that every one of these fears is, is like a bar in your own prison. Mm -hmm. And the, the faster you can get rid of them, the more free you're going to become. And can I encourage you to um, challenge your emotional fears? Two of my biggest fears have been around sexuality and around connecting to my soulmate. And um, I'm really scary, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame her. Is it, but isn't that ironic? The two really beautiful gifts that I have in my life, I have the most terror around. And it's ta taken a lot of um, diligence on my part. Initially, I, with sexuality, I had to go through a lot of feelings of, I can't do it, remind myself of the truth. Oh, yep, I'm go I can open myself emotionally. I can do these things and it, like the rewards have been massive and it's just starting to happen on a deeper level now with these deeper emotions between us mm. so go for the things that ski that's why I say go for the things that ski the most and the emotional terrors the interpersonal terrors like I was saying to Jen earlier it, it's not just being on the roller coaster and being out of control of your body it's actually the emotions that were coming at you at that time they're the scary things and if you can challenge them, it just the growth is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever it was that wanted to get on the roller coaster, that was Jen, wasn't it? Yeah, girl, you're gonna love a roller coaster. <laughs> Damn, they're good fun. <laughs> no, they are. Like when you when you get rid of your terror about it, it's amazing how much fun they are. Like I remember when going down, I think it was to Sea World. You know how they've got that one that does the spiralling things and loops and does a few of the spirals, you know, then you're hanging there. And, uh, and I was 
running up to the line, you jump in, and down, and run it. This, this was just a few years ago. <laughs> and then running back up the line again, you know, and it, was, it wasn't a very busy day, so, you know, we, we, we could go, you could almost get down to the bottom, you know, get to the end of it, and run that back up the top of the line and almost get the next ride down. So it was really awesome. We finished up myself and... Uh, I just having, I finished up probably having about 30 or 40 rides on the, <laughs> it's just so much fun. And, and that's the thing is you really enjoy everything after that. Like once you start dealing with terror, not just the physical terror, but the emotional terrors, and particularly the, the emotional terrors, mm. you start enjoying everything. So for example, many, many of you ladies have got a deep fear about sexuality, right? Well, when you start dealing with your terror about that, you'll actually start enjoying sexual, enjoying, you know, having sex with your partner. You'll you'll want it more. Yeah, you'll want it as much as he does or she does, right? And and that and that will drive that because you're now free. You're not you're not bound by the barriers of it. And the same applies with a lot of other things you do. Like many of you are not choosing yet to fully embrace your passions and desires. Why do you think that is? It's because of what you're afraid of that causes you to not do that. So once you confront the fear, what, do you think you're going to wait a year, two years, five years until you embrace something anymore? Of course not. You, you're not even going to... Like I hate putting something off for a day. Like you, you ask Mary what I'm like when I have a fashion going. It's like... Like, putting anything off for a moment is too long. Right? And that's what you'll finish up living your life more and more like. Yeah. Havana, would you like to ask a question? You've had your hand up so much today, I've noticed. Oh, Havana, I'm sorry, I <laughs> missed you. <laughs> I was actually gone for a while anyway, talking oh. to Michael, but I'm back again. Uh, just talking about sexuality. Um, oh, man, this is triggering. Okay, um, so I'm going to be living in a tent <laughs> with Justin. Right. <laughs> and um, I'm really scared right now. Um, but I'm just wondering, um, what is the loving thing to do? Like, if I am wanting to be sexually active, just say, and there's kids around, like... Yep. I've got a lot of, oh, I've just been remembering just some stuff from my childhood that's really gross. Yeah. And um, I feel... Where your parents sort of wanted you present? Yeah, like, um, one time I was in a... I changed my bedroom and I was in the office and um, Dad was with his new girlfriend and I could hear them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like I've got all this, um, I've got all these injuries to do with being um, sexual and stuff and like it's a dirty thing and mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering like if there are children around like, um, I don't know. Um, you don't need to ask anymore. It's easy to just <laughs> say the answer. Um, with, all, with all of your... Uh, and this applies to, to all parents, by the way. What will happen is... Uh, you remember all parents or people that are around children at any time. Here's the children, right, let's say. Here's the, here's the adults wanting to get it on. <laughs> now, those adults will have different emotions. Now... One of those emotions might be shame with your sexuality, for example. One might be fear with your sexuality, for whatever reason, whatever childhood reasons. Now, now when, when, when you two do interact in sexually, those emotions are going to come up and they will automatically attract the children into doing certain things. One of those things might be walking in on you. Right, is one of the things. And the key is to feel your, feel your emotion about what's going on every single time. It's the, it's the, adult emo the adult's emotions that create the actions of the children. Now, if the adults are in a pure interaction yeah, so without fear, things. shame, guilt and other emotions, the children will just naturally do their own thing until it's all over. And they won't be stressed to hear any noise about it either. They'll just say, oh, that's, that's just, you know, them having sex. And, and why would you have any 
problem with that? Like, because I've got emotions about it. <laughs> exactly. And that's why they're going to trigger you. Or oh, I'm feeling really embarrassed now that I am even talking about anything to do with sex. So. That's all right. Mary feels quite embarrassed about it too. Not anymore. I'm ready to do the sex and sexuality <laughs> workshop. Because <laughs> I've had like so much of this, hey, and I'm still working through it. But um, yeah. Mary, I feel Mary, so passionate about talking to people about sexuality because it was a huge burden in my life. Like I felt so shut down and yeah, shameful. Dirty. Yeah. yeah. So even before um, just discussing it with others, Mary would just shut down completely. But what happens is the more you discuss it, the more you deal with that shame. And that's the beauty of going towards your fears, is that the more you open about the fears and the more you open about the shame involved with it, and shame is just another emotion of which you normally are terrified of, right? Yeah, so with me feeling embarrassed now... Mm -hmm. um, so just feel that hot feeling that comes over you when you're embarrassed. And is that releasing it? Uh, if you or? continue to breathe, you know, diaphragmatically breathe, you know, just breathe and let yourself feel that hot feeling coming over you when you raise the issues regarding sex. Let yourself feel it. And when you feel it, what will happen is that's a bit of a release of some of that emotion. And then allow, allow whatever events. So interact sexually with your partner. Do you know what I mean? Don't avoid the sexual interaction no matter who is around. So Have sex every day, Ivana. <laughs> Um, well, Twice we a day. have not got to that point yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm serious. It's a great way to work through your issues. So right now, just have sex. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's no, not here anyway, I'm not. But... I'm suggesting for people who are already yeah. in a sexual relationship. Sure. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of beauty of working in a loving relationship and actually having sexual interaction fairly constantly. Because the, the beauty is you trigger a lot of your fears and a lot of your shames and a lot of your childhood issues. The key is to do it, though, for the right purpose. And yeah, the purpose yeah. is to express love to each other and to grow. And I should um, qualify that and say, enter a loving sexual interaction with your partner every day. It doesn't have to culminate in anything. It doesn't have to, you know, just allow yourself to feel the emotions that are triggered. Yeah. And if you're both on the path, it's beautiful. You just feel the emotions that are there. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes what will happen in, a, in any one day is you might do that two or three times. Uh, where you might you know, kiss and cuddle and interact in a, on a sexual way all the time during the day, but then there might be two or three times in the day where you might want to go to bed together uh, or, or have some kind of you know, real sexual interaction, deeper sexual interaction. The key is just to go ahead with that, but not go ahead with the expectation of an outcome. Go ahead with the expectation oh, yeah. of, I'm just going to stay emotionally yeah. present here in this interaction. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, and yeah. if I stay emotionally present here in the interaction, sometimes in the interaction, for example, in our... Mary doesn't mind now speaking about it so much. So, um, In our interaction, sometimes um, I'll, I'll just maybe lose my erection, for example. And, uh, and we, we'll just stop and we'll go, all right, what's going on here emotionally? What were you feeling? What was I feeling? You know, what was going on? Every time there's been some deep emotions involved with that. Other times Mary will go into, like, she might feel terrified and try to go out of body, for example. And we just, all right, stop. What's going on here emotionally? And, and a lot of times you can get into the emotion and you don't finish, uh, like, what you were doing because one of you might be crying for an hour later. Yeah. Still crying for an hour later. But the key is to allow that to happen on a regular basis. Because if you allow that to happen, you'll challenge the emotions involved. Yeah. Um, Justin and I have been really shut down to um, like feeling our emotions uh, like in front of each other. So it's... I don't really... <laughs> Maybe I do know why I'm crying. Yeah, but <laughs> but there's some really good reasons. Almost every couple really has this same issue at the moment on the planet. There's, there's very little really pure sexual interactions at the moment between couples on the planet because there are these walls that exist between the genders that we need to remove before each one of us can trust the other fully. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when you feel that wall there, discuss what the wall is and, and let yourself work through emotionally what is causing me to... I, like, so sometimes I feel like... I can sometimes feel Mary's judgment of me. So I say to her, Mary, look, darling, 
Like, I just feel you're being judgmental of me and it makes me very, very hard for me to be open and vulnerable when I know that you're going to feel attacking towards me at some, at some point, if you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just allow myself to feel the judgment and talk, speak openly and honestly to Mary about the judgment. And if Mary's owning her emotion, she can walk through why she feels that judgmental emotion and, and so forth. And we can deal with it together and we can start taking this wall, which is actually a fear barrier that exists between the sexes at the moment. Yeah. And we can, dis we can disband that wall, but we're not going to do it without effort. You know, it's not going to just disband magically without us I challenging that. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was really resistive and within the last week I've just sort of opened up a whole lot more to Justin and stuff and yeah. um, it's really quite lovely yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. I've never experienced anything like this before so it's cool. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. 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 Bruce, you had a question. Thank you. Um, going back to before, like you would pick Mary up for... Um, going into her self-blame or whatever. Where's, where's your law of attraction in this play out that, you know, you've had this event happen to you? How do you sort of... I mean, you know, like, it seems like a bat and ball game, in a, in a way, you know what I mean? Well, that's your law of attraction, that and that, you know, backwards and forwards. Yep. Um, goes on. That's, yeah, my experience, I guess. So, how, yeah, how do you sort of explain that? When you, what do you mean? How do you explain what in well, particular? If you said to Mary, you, you sort of have a very combative view of a relationship, don't you? Um, yeah. Can you I see that? Yes, I do. From the history of your relationship, yep. it's quite a combative view of the relationship. Um, my feelings about relationship are very different to that now. Um, my feelings are that it's about me embracing Mary and Mary embracing myself. And so whenever Mary goes into a self-blame state, she's no longer in even embracing herself and neither is she embracing me in that state. So there's no point in me remaining in this relationship at this particular moment in time. So I might as well go and do something else that's more productive. Does that make sense? Now, in terms of my law of attraction, there is certainly a law of attraction there for me. And that law of attraction is the deep sadness I've felt the majority of my life having my soulmate reject me. So, so the truth is that due to the emotions that uh, we had at the moment of incarnation, Mary has had a deep hatred and a resentment towards me as her soulmate from the moment of our reincarnation, which I have felt all of my life, which I then have acted out in a lot of my life. And, uh, and there is a, underneath that for me a deep grief that I need to grieve. And so when Mary feels these things to, towards me, I allow myself to go into my grief. Now, if Mary doesn't allow me to go into the grief, then I remove myself from Mary and go into my grief. Can I just say, any time you're saying to your partner, that's your law of attraction, whoa, whoa, I'm not wanting to own myself and I'm wanting to go, you look at you. Any, just like any time I say that, I'm out of harmony with love. Yeah. 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 So, so my feelings are always, I always look at myself first in every single interaction with every single person. And, uh, and, and, and in that process, also attempt to stay in truth and love with the person involved. So, of course, I've had the most practice with that with Mary because we're the closest together, as you will have with your own mate, because you are the closest together. So the more you practice being open and truthful and loving with your mate, and the more you practice loving your mate under all circumstances, even when they are angry and upset, then the more you will grow from that experience. Yeah. I was talking to AJ last night. I just had quite a, a beautiful realisation about um, when, you, when both partners are on the divine love path and you both desire God, you're on the same side. <laughs> You know, and when you fall out of that and feel like this person's not on my side anymore, either someone's lost sight of God or you've lost sight of the truth of the situation. Because the truth is when we both desire God, we're both going to want to feel ourselves and we're both going to want to love each other. We're going to want to have that. We won't feel like enemies. You know, a lot of relationships, you finish up feeling almost like enemies. 
and my pattern of relationships was bartering. I'll give you this, you give, you give me, me that. that. Da, da, da. That's a close, good, loving, working relationship. And the truth is totally different. Because yeah. love is a gift, of course, so both need to learn to give. In our relationship, if I can explain what's been happening a lot, so here's myself sort of working my way through my emotions and Mary work, trying to work her way through her emotions too. So both of us are trying to work through our emotions. There's a whole group of spirits around us constantly trying to interrupt our relationship. Now, this is happening in particular for Mary and myself because of our identities and what our relationship means in terms of our, in terms of our growth and what's going to happen in the future. And so what happens is these groups of spirits, and these, have, these spirits have come to speak with us actually and talk to us about how much they are going to try to harm us. Right? So, so they, have very, they have a very strong intent to harm our relationship. Does that make sense? So the moment I get out of an emotion and into an addiction, now they can hook through me to harm our relationship. The moment Mary gets out of her causal emotion and into addiction, these spirits can hook into her and harm our relationship. And so often what's happened in the past is that when one of us or the other of us have got into an emotion, so let's say Mary has got into an emotion where she's wanted to avoid an emotion, what, what, what will happen is these spirits then feed her a heap of lies, which the, she then finishes up voicing to me. And can I point like, out, this happens for a lot of couples, not just us. No, this, this is, is happening very for many of you, by the way. Common. <laughs> the same thing. And the realisation for me was like, wow, I'm letting myself be a vehicle here for some really... And of course, AJ, there's quite a few spirits who are feel quite nasty towards AJ and so I was letting myself be a voice for some really dark stuff all because I wanted to avoid my own emotions. So these, these spirits primary purpose is to attack myself right and, and in our, this, is, this is their primary purpose. Their, their point is if they attack me and stop me doing what I'm currently doing then straight away all of you will be affected by the fact that you're not getting constant a constant series of truth coming to you. Does that make sense? And then you'll have to be a lot more dedicated to discovering your own truth than if you have somebody who you can listen to and talk to about truth. And so what they, they've obviously, they see me as a focal point at the moment of if they can destroy me in any possible way, then that makes their job, that means that their life becomes easier. You know, their definition of their life being easier is they want their emotional addictions being met. Uh, and I'm, by t teaching you the things that I'm teaching you, are stopping these spirits from being able to meet their emotional addictions anymore with you. And potentially with everyone on the planet if we keep going as a group. Because a lot of them are angry women who are angry with men. So within your own relationships, they have an emotional addiction to, I just want to dump rage on any man I can find. Okay, here's a woman who doesn't want to feel her stuff. I'll get this is a great vehicle to dump some more rage on a man. Oh, if somebody teaches her she can feel her own emotions, they don't have their vehicle anymore. Now, before I met Mary, I was willing to completely feel all of my own emotions and I learnt to do that. So what that meant was that every time they projected rage or every time they projected anything to do with terror, my own terrors that, I, that I'd be open to experiencing, I would just go into it emotionally and experience it. The, the act, what, that hap what happens when you do that is it makes you stronger. The stronger you become, the less they can have an effect on you. So what do they start doing then? After a while, they can't have any effect on you. So what, what's the only way they can affect you? Is to find another person who's interacting with you and affect them in some way. And therein lies a lot of my terror. <laughs> right? And so what happens then is that Mary's, due to her fear of women's spirits and men's spirits, there's a lot of spirits who are around us now who were around us in the first century. So, and Mary's very sensitive to spirits, so therefore very sensitive to their projections at her. And so then very tempted to get out of her own emotions and then becomes just a vehicle for attacking me and, and my own investment in my relationship with Mary, which is a part of the issue, part of my problem, is because I am wanting to be conciliatory to Mary at times and wanting to, you know, do those kind of things, I then hook into the projection and I feel bad. And so Just these spirits, through that action, make, can make me feel bad because of my hook into Mary's emotions. Does that make sense? 
And so what I'm having to do is grieve that and release my hook into Mary's emotions. So I'm less and less hooked into what Mary feels about me. So I'm, not, I'm still interested in what Mary feels, but I don't take on Mary's beliefs of what she feels about me. So in the past she's felt many things about me that, as she'd recognised, haven't been very loving. And as a result of that, I would be hooking into that and feeling lots of grief. And now I'm feeling a lot less grief. And so what I do now is when I notice the self-punishment or I notice that I just don't feel the need to stay there anymore. And what's happening is, so I have a huge terror about spirits influencing other people around us. Mm -hmm. AJ's not as afraid of that anymore. So what happens is spirits do influence people around us, but who do they come knocking on the door of? Me. <laughs> And because I'm still hooked in, like having this terror, wanting this feeling like that I've been working on of wanting him to lessen his... Then, then of course they're going to attack me. I'm far more susceptible to go and attack AJ, aren't I? They can't have as much influence here because AJ's not as susceptible to these people. He's only susceptible to me. And, and one of the false beliefs that affects us is, obviously, if, if either of us grow in love, right we become brighter. And this happens to you every single moment you grow in love. Every single moment you grow in love, you become brighter. If you could picture the earth for a moment, just in your mind, picture the earth, and every six, there's six and a half billion people on the earth, most of whom are in a dark condition from a spirit perspective that you can barely see, right, from a spirit perspective. And then all of a sudden, over there in the corner, somewhere in Butterham, there goes off a bright light. Or over in the Mullabar, there goes off another bright light. Right? That's you just increasing your, your, your amount of love, your condition of love. And there's bright. Now, now, what will most spirits feel desi uh, desire to do, do you feel? Well, they'll come and investigate you. Right? And, and if they have a malevolent desire, they will want your brightness to decrease again. That's what they want. Right? So they want your brightness to go down. And so what, what they do is they try to impress you more to get your brightness now go, to go down. But if you're no longer hooked into these spirits anymore, and you're no longer hooked, you're, you're, you've gone through lots of issues of fear and whatever else, and you no longer care what anybody around you thinks, you're going to follow the divine love path no matter what else, the only people that can affect you are the people who are closest to you. They're the only people that can affect you. Well, even so, the people who are closest to us that we have hooks into, hmm. that's the only ones. They're way the only ones that can affect us. And so our spirit friends often then start focusing their attention on those people. Right? And sometimes it feels like, whoa, this feels like they're not friends anymore, you know. And, and it's different moment to moment because moment to moment many of us change and therefore we're no longer feeling those hooks or addictions with these spirits. But, but the issue, that, that, that's what we think is going to happen. But actually what happens is very different. What happens is when I grow in love and get brighter, and I have all these spirits come around me to investigate, at the end of the day, the more loving I become, the less anybody can affect me negatively. Isn't that not true? The more loving I become, the less anybody can affect me negatively. It doesn't matter if the whole world is against me. I will not feel it as a negative event anymore. The more loving I become, once I'm at one with God. Does that make sense? And so actually, the beauty of love is that it forms a protective barrier around firstly yourself, and then if it's a loving relationship, around yourself and your partner, that's impossible to penetrate. Even if one of you dies, it's impossible to penetrate the barrier. Right? It's impossible to break the love relationship. And so that becomes the strongest bond. There's a lovely verse in the Bible that says that a, th a threefold cord can never be torn in two. And what, what it alludes to is if you get some rope and you just have one strand of rope, which is just one person, then it's very, very like easy compared to break that right but you get two of us together now the two of us working together in a relationship now the bond if we're in a relationship where we're in agreement we're both on the divine love path or we're both progressing in love at least 
Um, now there's a binding force that binds the two of us together, is there not? But if you also incorporate God in the link, it now becomes a threefold cord, right? Very, it's very, very hard to traumatise that cord into breaking, right? no matter what you do, no matter how tough things get. Because the bliss that you experience in the relationship is like a bar an automatic barrier to any negative effects around you. If you imagine for a moment that you feel so blissful in your relationship, imagine that there is no, nothing like you trust the other person implicitly, you can feel all of their emotions, they can feel yours, you know you're passionately loved by them, you know they have a passionate sexual desire for you, you have a passionate sexual desire for them, you, they have a passion to know you, you have a passion to know them, and you're in this constant state where you just join together. You imagine that for a moment. Do you think many other people are going to be able to affect that? Not very easily, hey? They're not going to be able to come along and whisper in your ear about your partner, even, can they? Even if it's a spirit whispering in the ear. Well, I know my partner, you know, I know they're not like that, so I, that's not going to change. But if I have some emotions that, where I want my mum's approval of this relationship, who do they have to whisper to then? All they've got to whisper to is mum, and mum gets, you know, this relationship's no good, I'll go and talk to my daughter and tell her the relationship's no good, or I'll go and talk to my son and tell him the relationship's no good and the woman he's with no good. And before you know it, we've got trouble. And it just is that easy to break up a relationship. <laughs> Right? Very easy. And so what I've been recognising is that all of these fears, like all of my um, desire for mum's approval, all of my fear of spirits, they're all creating like a chink in this loving bond. And instead of trying to fix it, fix it, I just allow these events to... to I, imp I become more empowered in that process. Instead of feeling like, oh, I'm being attacked, I go, this is an opportunity to feel what this feels like so that I... You strengthen the bond. Allow the event to, to actually deal with an emotion that causes that chink to no longer be present. And then allow another event that causes that emotion to be exposed that now joins up that chink. And can you see you just turn the tables on these guys? You're act they're actually helping you now. And you can even speak to them about that. You can say, it's so good that you're coming to help me like this. So many of you are terrified about spirit influence, right? <laughs> But it's so good that they're, they're law, part of your law of attraction. They're actually helping you get your way through emotions. You may not be able to get your way through without their assistance, actually. So that they're actually assisting you in the process. Does Peter have a question too? I think so. If one of you goes down the front to Peter and the other one... If you come down the front, see. Go ahead. So if you don't get... Okay, um, AJ, as one of the people who are around you and Mary, like part of this group, I find myself holding back because of my, um, I know those spirits are there wanting to use me, you know, as a, as a negative influence. Mm -hmm. So. Don't um, hold back, Robert, just feel your emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it became obvious as you kept talking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So just um, do what I want to do and. Don't hold do back. Do what you want to do, be what you want to be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see that your fear is dictating that process? You're saying, I'm afraid of the spirit, so I'm going to hold back. Instead of going, I'm going to face my wall of terror, uh, step into my desire, and the possibilities are beautiful. I could have a great relationship with these guys. As long as I remain humble, no one's going to be able to influence that. Yeah. yeah. And there are times where myself, oh, I'll notice that somebody is being spirit influenced by some spirits sometimes, a lot of times from our first century experience. And, we, and I'll tell the person, look, you're being influenced by spirits from our first century experience. And, um, and, and we'll wait until the person gets through the process and comes out the other side. Sometimes they don't. There's been many in the past who have never come out the other side. Uh, and as a result, I've never seen them again um, because of their desire to to be in a rage with me and punish me for what they think I've done to them, uh, which I, I, I haven't done to them, but that's what they feel. And, so, and some of you in the audience have been in this position, even recently, right, where, where you've been influenced by spirits at different times. But, but know that w we love you. Like, even when you're spirit-influenced, rage, we love you. <laughs> and we love those spirits who are in that, in that place where they want to harm us too. Like, 
Now, that may yeah, not apply just to gonna Mary so much that. as myself. I've still got some fear of those spirits, so let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, Mary's had a bit of rage to do with them as well. Um, <laughs> not so much rage anymore. I'm more more fear. the terror of yeah. them now. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, um, if we can learn from these experiences and find out what our hooks are, and we'll talk about this a bit after the break, if we can learn from the experiences and find out what our hooks are, then we'll, we'll be in a much more powerful place permanently to help everyone around us and for us to have a good relationship with each other as well. Many of you have, uh, have growing friendships, right, here, here as you come along. And, and, uh, and those friendships can only really be influenced negatively by your uh, ability or your desire, I should say, to get away from your terrors and live in your addictions. Because when you live in your addictions, you're, you're so easily manipulated. Right? Many of you don't understand how easy it would be, if I wanted to manipulate you, how easy it would be to do. Right? Because if you can feel somebody's emotions and feel their emotional errors, how easy do you think it is to manipulate with them in that spot? Pretty easy. Right? So the truth is when you get more and more loving, you, you, get less, you don't have any desire to manipulate anyone. You want them to you just come to their own relationship and come to God in their own way. And, what it, and if they don't have a desire to do that and they want to spend five years away from you doing something else, that's fine too. You don't feel that so much. Peter, you had a question yeah. too? Yeah, just it. AJ, um, as the relationship between uh, yourself and Mary... Um, develops uh, to a much purer and higher, brighter level, um, additional to the negative beings that uh, spirits that try to influence uh, Mary or yourself in a negative way to um, degenerate the relationship or to degenerate the mission that you're on. There must also be a group of positive spirits who are attracted to your to your brighter beingness, who would be supportive and backing. Uh, the work that you're doing. They are already There's with many you. Now. They are already with us. Yes. Yeah. So, and so um, the truth is that, like here, let's say it's any couple on the divine love path here, right, on Earth. The women have got all oh, got bigger heads today, babe. What's that about? It's at the headband. <laughs> it's just a curious anomaly. If you have a close look at our heads. <laughs> Have I got a big head? You, you got a tiny head compared to me. It's like, <laughs> I find it quite embarrassing because sometimes when I put on a hat, it goes, oh, that's too small, and get another, oh, that's too small as well, that's too small as well. And someone says, how big is your head? It's like, anyway. And so here we are, here, here we are, the couple, whoever the couple is. You, if you're on the divine love path, you already have surrounding you this large entourage of celestial spirits desiring to be of positive assistance to you at all times. So they're there whether, no matter what's going on to, to a large degree, they're there trying to impress, because, because they can feel, here's, your, here's God, and they can feel your desire for God, and they, they want to assist you to, to meet those desires for God, right? They want to assist you. We did it again too. And, and <laughs> so they want to assist you in that desire. So they're always with you. And the issue is really who, which negative spirits can influence you at any time. Because the positive ones are always there trying to be with you and influencing you. The truth is also, though, that there are many natural love spirits. Um, <laughs> around you, right? And, and, and those natural love spirits, yeah, as you grow in brightness, they are more attracted to see what's going on because it's, it's a very unusual thing to see people on earth in relationships growing in brightness. And, and so, so when they see you, even individually, growing in brightness, they are more and more attracted. What's going on here? This is very strange. Look, it's, look it took me, took me 3,000 years to do what they're just doing. Like, what's going on? You know, there's a lot of that kind of wondering going on inside of them. And so, yes, they are often then attracted to you as well and want to help. Often they want to help based on their belief systems, which are not always accurate, but, but they want to help and, and uh, uh, help you as well. And so we've had many uh, natural love spirits come to us too who have wanted to help, and we've sat down with them and had chats with them, and, uh, and in the process uh, they worked out after a while that they couldn't help as much as they thought they would be able to help. Um, 
Um, and sometimes they have helped, by the way, like in terms of different things. Um, and, and, but they've never been unloving or malevolent. Whereas there's a whole group of very, very dark spirits over here. And, <laughs> and the group of dark spirits, um, their desire is only very selfish. And but the uh, beauty of dealing with, um, and the reason we talk about that, is when I deal with my fear of the dark spirits, then, because I've dealt with like a lot of fear about spirit connection, how easily can I connect with the bright ones? And yeah. I can feel their message a lot more and a lot more strongly and firmly in my life. Yeah. Like, um, I think I've shared before, I, st I watched that movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and got terrified for an hour and a half, and in the middle of the night started channeling. Like uh, before that I hadn't done anything. So it's just very, um, the more fear about spirits I deal with, the more able I am to channel my guides. Yeah. So Mary's now channeling pretty much most days and a lot of times two or three times a day to help her with the different emotions she's going through. And whereas, whereas like months ago or uh, over a year ago, she couldn't do any of that um, because of uh, as you even as you join together and your brightness just raises just a little you now have a better connection but those spirits these spirits are beautiful spirits they're always around you Pete they're always there hey it's just they just love you so much and and they they project they are constantly trying to connect with us constantly like, they're like friends who are positive friends who are just constantly trying to connect with us. And so those ones are not very influenced by how bad or what happens to our lives. They still want to love us. They're very similar to God in that way. It's the other spirits who we can affect a lot through our, through our emotional work. And obviously what we want to do is get to the point where we can interact with these malevolent spirits, but they don't influence us anymore. That's... Where we can help them, yeah. And we can interact with these six fear spirits, but they no longer influence us off the emotional connection with God anymore. And, and, and then we're loving both of them as well. That's when we're loving for both. Yeah. What would you like to talk about after the break? <laughs> well, that? Let's talk about sex, baby. We're happy to talk about sex if you want. Um, the the alternative is I started off a discussion, a group of discussions uh, in uh, Brisbane last week uh, regarding what happens when you die. Yes. And, uh, and I can just continue that discussion because most people who were present found that quite fascinating. So we can talk about that too. So let's have a break. There's a wonderful, uh, if you just give them five minutes or so to put the uh, food out, there's a wonderful collection of food out there, I noticed. I just... <laughs> I, I saw the kids out there eyeing it off. <laughs> You're lucky. You're lucky you got any left, if you. <laughs> Thanks, so everyone. I won't be back after the break, probably. Thanks, so, Mary. Yeah. Yeah.